like uh, people are admitted from the waiting room. So uh, before we start the meeting, I'd like to go over some ground rules. Uh, this will be a completely virtual meeting using the Zoom webinar platform. The platform has a capacity of 100 uh, attendees. Uh, public permits, actually it looks like we have 101. So maybe it has a higher capacity. Uh, public participants will be muted except during the public comment portion of the meeting where individuals wishing to comment will be unmuted individually. Uh, members of the public can indicate their desire to provide comment either by submitting a request in advance or by using the raise hand feature of the Zoom webinar. Uh, members of the public are asked to state their full name and address at the start of their comments. Uh, and as with our in-person meetings, the board meet this board meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the district website. And with that said, I will now call to order the Monday, June 8th meeting of the East Penn Board of School Directors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the first order of business is a roll call for attendance. Mrs. Allen? Ms. Bowman? Ms. President? Mr. Bird? Present. Mr. Champagne? Present. Mr. Jankowski? No. Dr. Levinson? Present. Dr. Munson? Present. Mr. Smith? Present. Ms. Winch? Present. Dr. Bacher? Here. All but uh, Mr. Jankowski were accounted for. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to request to address uh, the board. We have two people who requested in advance. Uh, first is uh, Nigel Watt on the uh, school resource officer. Can you let us know when he's unmuted? It won't let me bring him up to unmute. It says chat. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Campbell, do you have? Hi. Good evening. Oh, hold on. Here we go. Okay. I was able to unmute him. Okay. Mr. Watt, Good. Yeah. Mr. Watt, you may go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nigel Watt. I live at 130 North 5th Street in Emmaus. My daughter is a rising first grader at Jefferson. During the concurrent economic crisis and national conversation on policing, I am here to ask the board to reconsider the school resource officer position here to impugn the individual officer serving in the position. Instead, I ask you to consider whether the SRO, while doing his or her job properly, makes children safe. While we are forced to reduce the instructional staff, I have been so impressed by when volunteering in my daughter's kindergarten classroom, does it make sense to transfer $123,000 to the borough of Emmaus for a dedicated officer at the school? In the case of a true emergency where a single officer would need backup anyways, we are fortunate to have the Emmaus Police Department very close by. Police officers are not psychologists or drug treatment counselors. They are part of the criminal justice system and they arrest people. At Emmaus High School, the SRO arrests children and routes them through the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your input, Mr. Watt. Um, moving on, the next uh, member of the public uh, is Julie Shook, Shock. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, so I am an, I'm an employee in the district and my question is, I'm just curious um, if there will be, with this proposal for um, the fall, if there will be lunch and recess and specials for this school year and um, 
for the proposal, if is it just half the year or would it be the whole school year? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I guess we'll uh, probably cover that during the presentation. So if you stay on uh, for uh, the presentations, that'll be covered uh, uh, later in the board meeting. Thank you for your input. Are there any attendees raising hands? I don't see any. Do you see any, Mrs. Allen? Then we'll, no. uh, then we'll move on uh, to uh, approval of the minutes. May I have a motion to approve both the May 11th and May 26th minutes? Ziad Munson, so moved. Joshua Levinson, second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird. Yes. Mr. Champagne? Yes. Mr. Jankowski? He's not here. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Winch? Yes. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Eight ayes. Motions pass. Uh, moving on to presentations. Uh, Mrs. Campbell, you'd like to introduce the various presentations? Yes, we are fortunate joining us this evening for the first of our presentations is Dr. Kate Kiras, principal of Emmaus High School. And she will be starting with an overview of the use of time committee and some adjustments that will be um, happening as part of the high school schedule for the upcoming school year. In addition, she will then transition into some of the changes that will um, be recommended to the program of studies. And then finally, she and Dr. Pekarik will um, conclude the, the presentation this evening by providing the board and the public with an update on the high school's targeted support and improvement plan, which is a, an action planning process that's required by the state. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Kirez for the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Um, board, thank you very much for having me. I, I appreciate being able to be here in this very strange and different format. Um, so I'll do my best. I know that you have a packed agenda this evening, um, but I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the outcome of the work that has been conducted over the course of this year. Um, we've called it our use of time committee at the high school. Um, and our goal was to um, examine our high school schedule and make some recommendations to you um, regarding changes. So I'm going to share my screen so I can uh, get this presentation rolling for you. Okay. Maybe just give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so I'll start off with a slide that I shared um, with our, our staff that was working on this team, as well as during our um, uh, parent overview sessions that we had in our, in our staff overview sessions over the course of the winter. When you're talking about a schedule, um, certainly in a high school, um, so much of what we do is driven by the schedule. It's driven by the way that we uh, use and allocate time. And really, it's important to know that um, research has not identified a correlation between um, specific school scheduling models and student achievement. Um, and research shows that the schedule itself has a negligible long-term effect on student achievement. And so what experts recommend is that the best approach when you're looking at your high school schedule, or um, for that matter, any school schedule, that the best approach is to evaluate the schedule um, by building consensus around district priorities. Uh, and ultimately, research shows that the, effect of any, that the effectiveness of any schedule is, is really significantly variable and depends a great deal on the quality of curriculum and instructional practices. 
I do want to point out, I'm not sure the exact number, but we do know that our schedule at Emmaus High School hasn't been significantly changed in decades, um, possibly as long as more than 40 years. Um, and in that time, we certainly have um, made a lot of progress um, societally with um, integration of technology and certainly brain research and other educational research that's told us a great, that we, where we've learned a great deal about instructional best practice and what works for students in, in the classroom. Um, so our goals as a team were to look at our schedule and um, ask ourselves a couple of questions. Um, in what ways does our master schedule meet the needs of our students? In what ways does it limit our ability to do so? In what ways does our use of time support our instructional goals? Um, certainly we have a strong comprehensive plan that was developed with um, a great deal of work with community stakeholders. And so we really wanted to keep that comprehensive plan and the, its instructional priorities in mind as we were doing this work. Um, and in what ways does our use of time support the priorities of our stakeholders? So again, research tells us we really need to know what our stakeholders um, think and expect and need in a schedule. And so it was really important to us to really lead with getting information from our community, from our students, from our staff, and from parents about what they value. Um, and so we'll talk to you about how we did that. Ultimately, our goal was to identify schedule options that would support our students' needs, our goals, and the priorities of our stakeholders, and then ultimately bring a recommendation to our superintendent and to you as the board um, uh, at the conclusion of the process. So the team that did this work um, was comprised of professional staff members um, and included representatives from all of our major academic departments. And we had um, one department chair from one of our elective areas who represented all of the elective areas. Uh, we had leadership from the East Penn Education Association, our Office of Teaching and Learning and Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, we had representatives from our gifted and our special education departments and certainly our Emmaus High School administrative team. Um, in addition, Ms. Whitman and Mrs. Campbell attended some of our work sessions and they provided a tremendous amount of support and guidance as we went through this process. So the timeline that we followed, we started our work, we had a full day session in November, and we examined our schedule, our current schedule through three lenses. Uh, we looked through the lens of curriculum and instructional practice, student needs and faculty and staff needs. Um, and we had a great dialogue and discussion about what do we value about the schedule that we have because this um, certainly isn't about, isn't about um, overhauling for the sake of overhauling. So we, as we were considering different scheduling models, we continued to consider our current schedule. It certainly wasn't a foregone conclusion that we were going to bring you a different, something different. Um, but we talked about um, what works in our schedule through those different lenses, perhaps what our challenges are, and then we brainstormed the components that we would need to include in a survey that we wanted to send out to our stakeholders. So in December, we um, developed and deployed surveys. Um, and those of you who uh, perhaps are parents in the district or those who are um, attending the meeting this evening, perhaps had an opportunity to complete one of those surveys. Um, we surveyed students and we had uh, just over um, 2,000 responses from students. We surveyed parents um, K to 12 because we thought it was really important to hear from not just parents of students who are currently at the high school, but parents of students who perhaps hadn't come to the high school yet, but had some, some, some great things to say about what they valued and what they thought was important. We had about 740 parent responses, which I thought was really um, exciting. And then we also surveyed our faculty and staff and had nearly all of those, all of our faculty participate. Um, so when we met then in January, we analyzed those results um, and we put together a uh, summary of those results and then we conducted some stakeholder feedback sessions. So that looked like me spending time with um, in small groups optionally with faculty and staff. We had an evening event where we invited parents to come and provide a, and, and provide us some feedback. And our goal was really just to share the results of the of the survey um, and also sort of get their qualitative input on the results that we found. Um, and also, so in January, we, we looked at all of the feedback that we'd gotten and we started to examine sample schedules. So we looked at the US News top 50 schools in Pennsylvania. We looked at other high performing schools in our area and our region and looked for different scheduling models that they were employing. Um, and uh, ultimately we selected a few to game out fully. So um, the committee guided uh, myself and Lori Gamble, our assistant principal for academics, um, to really play through what each of these scheduling models might look like in Emmaus. And we also had the opportunity to develop a decision-making matrix, which um, ultimately would allow us to uh, weight certain um, 
aspects of the schedule based on how much of a priority they were for various stakeholders. And I can show you a little bit of what that looked like. Um, over February and March, we developed those sample schedules, as I was mentioning. And then in May, um, a few weeks ago, uh, even though we were remote, we brought the team together um, two times over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, and we evaluated those sample schedules that we built and we ran them through the scoring matrix that we had developed. And ultimately, we selected an option that we think um, will really best, need, best meet the needs of our students and the priorities. Um, and then we, we went on to further develop that a bit with some more input from our, um, especially our partners at LCTI and our food service departments to work through some of the logistics. So I'll share this slide with you. Um, this is a, sort of a summary and it, it gives you an indication by stakeholder group of what the priorities were of each stakeholder group in a new schedule. So we asked, um, we provided these various categories and we asked people to rank them as far as what was most important to them. Um, and so the takeaway here is that if an item is bolded, it appeared within the top five priorities for at least two groups. And the groups again were students, parents, and faculty and staff. If it's a starred item and there was one, it appeared in the top five priorities for all three groups. So if you look at this slide briefly, you can see that um, students really prize having study time built into their schedule during the day. It's very important to them to have choice and options in terms of various courses that they're able to take and to not have a schedule that would limit their ability to take um, a full breadth of courses that they're interested in. Flexibility had a lot to do with um, students being able to uh, take classes at the, at the college level if they wanted to through dual enrollment and maybe have the option for late arrival or early out, those kinds of things. Um, and they also valued the ability to build relationships with their teachers, to have sustained interactions with their teachers to build relationships. Parents, a lot of similarity. Um, their number one was they really value um, opportunities for extra help and enrichment for their children during the school day. Um, they value uh, instructional um, structures that allow for high performance. So um, being having enough time in class to be able to implement high quality instructional practices. Choice and options again came up for parents um, and study time again, having some time embedded in the school day for, that's dedicated to student study. Faculty and staff really valued having a, a schedule that's, that's simple and consistent. Um, having the ability to build relationships with students through sustained interaction in the classroom, choice and options, and then you see that instruction for high performance. So we saw a lot of, a lot of correlation across the different groups. Ultimately, what we landed on um, as a recommendation is a, 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 a block schedule, but it's called an AB block, and I can explain what that looks like a little bit. Now, I know board members, you have a detailed report in your board report, a detailed description of this, and certainly, um, you know, once we work through some of these logistics, we'll be sharing a lot more information with the public as well about what the schedule looks like. But in terms of a high level overview, in an AB block schedule, students attend four classes per day instead of the current not had nine period day. And they attend them on an AB rotation. So students have half their classes on A days and the other half on B days. One credit courses um, are full year every other day and half credit classes are a semester in duration. We also um, moved back from five minutes of passing time to six minutes of passing time. We heard from about 200 students that they'd really love just a little bit more time to get from one class to another. And so we felt like it was important to honor that, that request. Um, uh, two other features of the schedule are that um, around, lunch, around the lunch time embedded in the third block class is an advisory time which is essentially a bit of an expanded homeroom. Um, we heard in the surveys from students and teachers that a lot of them missed having that touch point on a daily basis for homeroom. Um, we also think that it's really important to preserve instructional time and there are a lot of things that disrupt instructional time. And so having an advisory period in the middle of the day allows a little bit of downtime for students, a little bit of study time if they don't have a study hall in their schedule. It allows them to watch the announcements, to um, get some information from their teacher about things that are coming up. Um, and allows us to do a lot of those kinds of things that um, surveys, uh, career awareness lessons, those kinds of things that are, don't necessarily belong to any particular curricular area but are still really important for our kids. And then additionally, we've added something called a Hornet period. Now, if you're familiar with the high school schedule, you know we have a flex block once a week. And the biggest challenge with flex block has been that a lot of the things that in, in the AB schedule we would work into advisory have competed for the time in our flex block. Um, so Hornet period is similar to our flex block, but what it would look like would be um, in the morning before first period, two days a week. 
and it would be based on completely driven by student needs and interests. So students who need extra help would be able to be called by their teacher to get extra help. We'd be able to implement interventions. Our special ed teachers would be able to meet on a more regular basis with the students on their caseload, the same for our gifted students. And we also could allow students some time um, to meet in clubs. Um, some students are so busy with things after school that they're not always able to meet in clubs. So we would be able to do some of that during that time. And we also anticipate for those students who, who um, didn't necessarily have a need for remediation or were being pulled for something during that time, it also could be a late arrival for at least for those students who are able to provide transportation who are upperclassmen. So this is a picture of what the schedule looks like. You can see on a day with a Hornet period, the instructional periods are about 71 minutes in duration, which is a nice amount of time to allow teachers um, to be able to do more hands-on authentic uh, learning experiences, differentiate their instruction, um, spend more sustained time engaging students. Um, you can see that there are uh, lunch periods that are about a half an hour long. And then around those lunch periods, there is an advisory, um, which it's hard to see in this bell schedule. But um, the reason the third block is extra long is because it includes the instructional time, the lunch time. So each student's lunch and each teacher's lunch is embedded in their third, bl third block class. Um, and it also includes that advisory time. And then you can see on days where there's no Hornet period, the classes would be uh, longer. Um, so this is a sample student schedule that I thought would be helpful for you to see. And I know you have other, other schedules that are, that are in the longer report that I provided for you. But on a sort of a six day rotation, we wouldn't any longer be on the one to the day one to day six. We would just be alternating A days and B days. But we would have Hornet period two days a week on Tuesday and Friday. If we didn't have school on Friday, we just wouldn't have Hornet period that day. Um, but Tuesdays and Fridays pretty solidly, we would have the Hornet period. And you can see if I'm a student on the A days, I have um, four of my classes. And on my B days, I have the other four. So I'm still able to take um, pretty much the same amount of credits that I was able to take before. Mostly um, the difference from eight to nine periods is right now in our nine period day, lunch is a separate period. And on this eight period day, lunch is embedded in the third block class. So it allows us to maintain that choice um, that we know that students were looking for. Um, so our next steps um, after this point would be to take some time to communicate the change with students and families. Um, I certainly want to point out that our goal was to implement this schedule in the fall of 2021. And it appears, I know there are other presentations this evening to share with you some of the preliminary plans for what school might look like when we open in the fall. Um, and I think we, we all recognize that um, school may be different in the fall. Uh, and so this schedule that we've presented to you is our ideal schedule and it's the one that we would recommend implementing beginning in the fall of 2021. But we are recommending that we move to a form of our block schedule next fall. Um, and the reason for that is because it's certainly a, it's a more efficient schedule for a variety of reasons. It will allow us to um, uh, accomplish some of those budgetary priorities in terms of um, not replacing some of our staff that are retiring without significantly increasing class size or um, cutting any programs. Um, and additionally, um, the longer sustained periods we think will help us um, engage with students and, and um, develop those relationships and make sure that we're able to um, do the best we can to fill some of those gaps that have been created through this, this fourth marking period um, closure. So our second next step would be, we would certainly provide professional development opportunities for our faculty and staff. Teaching a class on a 70 or 80 minute period looks very different than on a 41 minute period if you're doing it effectively. Um, and so we know that they would need some guidance and support in terms of what high quality instruction on a block schedule would look like. Um, we certainly would support students, staff, and families as we adjust the new schedule. So as I've pointed out, there is no ideal perfect schedule um, for a school building, and any schedule is going to have um, system-wide advantages and disadvantages, and it's also going to present advantages and disadvantages to individual students. And so we know that we have a responsibility to evaluate and analyze the schedule and see where the challenges are for individual students or groups of students and make sure that we're meeting their needs as we implement it. Our goal also would be to monitor and evaluate this new schedule annually for the first couple of years. So if we find that there are things that are working or challenges that we need to overcome, then we want to make sure that we, we don't take a couple more decades to take a look at this. Um, and, you know, as I've pointed out, certainly our, our schedule in the fall will be a, a modified version of this in, in some ways. And I think that'll be spelled out in the presentation later. Um, and um, 
so sort of the next part of this is for me to share with you some of the adjustments that we need to make to our program of studies, which is typically approved in November or December of each year. But there are a couple of adjustments that we need to make to our um, program of study in order to be able to adjust some credit values for some courses and things like that to make the block run. But I would ask Mrs. Campbell, would you like me to take questions now about the first part of the presentation or just move on to the second? I think it might make sense if we take a, a brief pause and answer any questions specific about the schedule that you've just proposed. Dr. Munson. Sure, thank you for the, the presentation as well as the, the detailed um, background materials that, uh, that was sent ahead of time. I must um, admit um, they're complicated. They're complicated, yeah. and I spend quite a bit of time trying to puzzle through them. Um, so I'm I'm excited about a schedule um, that that opens greater possibilities. Um, for, I mean, it seems to me that the great beneficiaries of this schedule are um, lab-based classes and studio-based classes. Um, I, I don't know if that's right, but um, I've you know I've long worried that the the very short um, periods that we have. Um, preclude a lot of things that might be done in those areas um, just because of, of lack of time. Um, but so, but I do have a couple of questions. One is, I don't actually understand, like somehow the math is escaping me that allows you to save staff where you need fewer staff to teach the same number of students the more instruction with no increase in class size. Where, where do the savings come from? So thank you, thank you for all that feedback and those comments. I, I agree with you. You know, you imagine if a student is in a ceramic studio and they have 41 minutes, by the time they set up and get the mud out and start throwing things, um, class is practically over. So I agree with you that in a lot of those applied areas, this is gonna be a benefit. Um, I think that the, um, when I share the program of studies revisions, um, mostly specific to the way that we're going to handle science labs and some other things, you'll be able to see um, some of, of the yield of that. Um, running a block schedule and having advisory time and the Hornet block built in also allows us to do a few things differently with um, some teacher responsibilities. So, for example, we have some teachers um, who currently serve on our ninth grade academy who teach five classes instead of six because the duty that we've assigned to them is to have um, meetings to analyze student data and evaluate student progress. Um, and they do that on you know, a weekly basis, a couple times a week. Um, but having the Hornet period in the advisory um, and having some flexibility in where students are and what they're doing during those times will allow us to provide coverage for those teachers on a regular basis so that they can come together and have that curriculum meeting, that, that student programming meeting. Um, but they can also teach six classes um, and still be consistent with what the expectations are in their contract. So the combination of doing things differently with duties and then also reducing um, the credit value for some of our science courses because we're going to be able to implement some of those lab activities in the existing block scheduling period, the combination of those two things will allow us to accommodate those reductions without adjusting the number of sections of courses that we would have run with those teachers still in place. Okay, so it, it, it's essentially a matter of uh, faculty utilization and, and what, they're, what they're being asked to do. Is that, is that fair? It's a combination of faculty utilization and at least in, in particularly in the science area, a, a, a reduction in credit for some of our courses that have separate labs attached now that we, that we would be handling differently. Okay, and what about, um, you know, I, I know one of the things that a number of us have voiced concerns about in, in, in past meetings is the, the, the sort of increasing demands on teachers to be in individualized meetings that basically require them to not be in the classroom. Um, is, there, is there any discussion of using the advisory and or Hornet periods um, for many of these meetings? And, and if so, would that, would that increase our ability to have teachers not substitutes in front of students during instructional time? 
Thanks for the question. So um, it depends on the type of meeting, I suppose. But if we're talking about regular collaboration on curricular goals, for example, um, let's say our English department, for example, is which they are going through a curriculum revision and they're going to need to meet together in grade level teams on a regular basis to sort of collaborate. Yes, it's possible that during the Hornet block, um, because of a combination of things, students will be moving based on what their needs and desires are. So some students will desire to have a large group study hall because they have work that they need to do at that time. Some students will be coming in later because they have that privilege to be able to do it. And so moving the students around differently allows us to free teachers up. This is a model that has worked at Southern Lehigh, for example. They run an AB block schedule and they have a, um, I think they call it a Spartan period. Yes, in the middle of the day. Um, and on a weekly basis, they bring their departments together. So on Monday, for example, the students are meeting with teachers in other curricular areas and going to some large group study halls and their entire English department is able to meet during that time and collaborate. So yes, we do anticipate that we would be able to use Hornet Block the same way. Great, the, I guess I have another, I mean, I'm gonna phrase it in, in terms of a question, but really, as you'll see, it's, it's mostly a comment and a concern, um, which you're welcome to address or not. Um, you know, I, I recognize the, the, the sort of process that this grew out of, recognize that the plan had been to be waiting a full year uh, before implementing this. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems important to me um, because, you know, I, I think you, you were charitable when you said that there, that effective teaching in these larger time blocks to do it effectively requires a much different approach. What, what makes, you know, we're already throwing an awful lot on our teachers and our students. What makes you confident that this, this sort of major retooling of class periods can also be done you know, in the summer when, you know, teachers are off contract in time to have effective teaching in this block schedule in the fall? Well, I suppose I can respond to that in a couple ways. Um, you know, one of them is to acknowledge that we're already in really unusual circumstances and the instructional model that we're going to be implementing for students in the fall is going to potentially look very different. Um, and so, um, being able to provide support for teachers. The instructional model in the classroom, depending on what occurs in the fall, we may have a, a less students in the classroom with teachers, for example, on a daily basis. Um, so um, it's, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be a spoiler alert for the later presentation, um, but I can say that I've been involved in a lot of the planning and the discussion preliminarily around what the instructional, what our instructional approach is going to be next year, and it is going to be significantly different anyway. Um, and our concern is really wanting to make sure that students, when they are with us, aren't rushing from one class to another in short bursts, um, but that they're having sustained interactions with teachers. And so for a student to come in and go through four classes in a particular day is a much more focused approach for them. Even if the, even if the teachers are working through the implications of that new instructional approach, I also would add that we've been providing um, our comprehensive plan really um, um, aligns to the type of instruction that we're talking about here. So we have worked with our teachers through the curriculum and instruction process to develop authentic assessments to, uh, in the English department, for example, use a workshop model um, to adjust their instructional practices. But what we haven't adjusted is the system in order to help them implement what they understand to be best practice. And so I think that this is going to be very freeing for a lot of our teachers. When I go in and observe in a classroom and I see a teacher trying to implement those best practice strategies, it's always a rush because by the time they take attendance, the students get an opportunity to really dig into something and start collaborating with each other. The class period is over and they're out the door of the next yeah. class. Um, and so I think, I think they know, um, I think we, we can give them a lot of credit for knowing what good instructional practice looks like. And I think um, it isn't a complete overhaul, but I think it's, um, we certainly will provide support for teachers, but I think in a lot of cases, they're already trying to do this and it just isn't fitting the model that we already have. That's great. And I, I would just want to underscore the, the sort of need for support. Um, I always get nervous with each of these big changes that we've been, we've been making um, with the one-to-one -one program, um, moving, on, moving online uh, this spring um, and so forth. Um, I, 
I, I, I mean, no disrespect, but I, I think to, to be frank, right, we have, a, we have a diversity of both interests and ability uh, to make those changes fairly rapidly uh, in the classroom. And um, some people just need a little help. And uh, I want to make sure that the district is providing that help. Uh, so that we can be using the resources that we have most effectively. So thank you for your presentation, Dr. Kiras. Thank you, I appreciate your feedback. Thank you, Dr. Munson. Um, Dr. Levinson? Thank you, Dr. Bakker. And also thank you, Dr. Kiras, for the presentation. I have uh, three or four, hopefully, quick questions. Sure. Um, so I thought it was interesting for you to, because uh, one of the questions I had going into this was, was, was wondering um, you know, what the research says about the type of schedule. And I think that's very interesting to say that in the long term, um, there's no, there are no, you don't see detrimental effects one way or the other. So, um, but, but obviously there are some, some advantages to doing one or the other. Uh, but I am curious, how common is the block schedule um, in terms of, uh, well, you mentioned Southern Lehigh, but can we talk about Pennsylvania, perhaps? It's very common. Um, you know, block scheduling was sort of all the rage in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and lots and lots of schools moved to it. Um, and uh, in most cases on a semester block, where you had half of your classes in the fall, half your classes in the spring. Um, so it's fairly common um, in the Lehigh Valley. Um, we have block scheduled schools. The high schools in Bethlehem are block scheduled. Um, Southern Lehigh runs an AB block schedule. Um, Northern Lehigh, Northwestern Lehigh run a block schedule. Um, so there are some examples. I believe Nazareth also runs an intensive schedule. So there are several regionally in our area. Um, when you look outside of our region, it, schools are all over the map, um, but block scheduling is, is fairly common at the high school level. Uh, thank you. Um, well, one of the other things that, that, that came into mind too is when we last, in the last year, we talked about Jasper and the launch of Jasper mm -hmm. and, and certainly that the, the model for that school within a school uh, was gonna benefit from having I think a lot longer periods of time for students to, to group and group one another. So um, obviously you see synergies with, with the AB schedule with, with, with how Jasper has been around. Yes, I think so. Actually, we were planning to kind of retrofit our traditional schedule in, for Jasper by blocking those courses together. So if we were staying on a traditional schedule, our plan was to sort of schedule students in Jasper Social Studies right next to Jasper English so that they could create their own AB block um, in order to make this work. So um, I really appreciate your point that, that um, the approach that we're looking to take with Jasper um, will lend itself really, the, the block schedule will lend itself really nicely to yeah, that. There'll be few, fewer hoops to jump through to make that work, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, also, in looking at the, at the schedule, it looks to me like block three is probably gonna be the most challenging to, to implement because again, in order to, to not overrun the, the, the lunch room, you have to put the lunch in, in, in three different positions. And so some, some students will get the full 71 or 90 minute block, others will have, have it split and, or, or whatnot. Um, so are there, is, are there any, anything of concern in terms of how block three is implemented? And then I guess with that, can any, is any course eligible to go in block three or there, is there gonna be certain types of courses that, that might go in block three that can better accommodate the disruption? So um, right now we're not necessarily, you know, we wanna create as few constraints in our master schedule as possible. Um, and um, I think we would just need to handle certain courses differently. So to your point, the split lunch, that's pretty common in a block schedule um, where uh, some, sec some courses will come uh, right to the class. They'll have 71 minutes of instruction. They'll have advisory and then they'll go to lunch. Um, in other cases, um, students may go straight to lunch and then go to class where they have their advisory period attached. Um, so, um, 
it's going to be uh, really important that some of those classes that are lab sciences, for example, or mm -hmm. wellness fitness classes are going to have to be in the group that has lunch first or has lunch last. We don't want right. students to have to run off the track and change and go to lunch and then go back. So what we will be mindful of is which courses need to have that sustained 71 or 84 minutes um, mm -hmm. in order to complete what they need to do and recognize that in other subject areas, it may not be so essential. I've taught on a block schedule. Um, I taught in Central Bucks, so I forgot to mention that's a district that's had a block schedule for a long time. Um, and sometimes I loved having the split lunch because I'd have the students for 40 minutes, we would dive into something, they'd have a mental and a yeah. physical break, and then they'd be able to come back. So yeah, I think we just need to be very mindful about which classes had the split lunch. Right, right, yeah, I, I agree. And then I guess my, my last point or question, I think in, in some of the materials you had provided beforehand was we're talking about the impacts to students who are on late arrival or early dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what's what's the how many students would be are, are are affected by that, or how many students do it now, and then you know, is this accommodation going to even be possible for those those students that are going to do it next year? So right now, when students request a late arrival or an early dismissal, um, it occurs first period every day, or it occurs ninth period every day. For a student to have a late arrival every day, um, they would actually take up two of their eight available instructional periods. So it's not impossible that a student might not might have late arrival every day or early out every day, depending on the other things that they're taking and what their progress is toward meeting their graduation goals. Um, most of the students who take advantage of those privileges are seniors, um, but juniors mm -hmm. are able to get a late arrival if they happen to have a study hall during that last period. Um, so it would be more difficult for students to have a late arrival or an early out every day. Um, but we do also have the Hornet period embedded. And so for some students who might not um, have room in their schedule because they're taking all eight classes, those students would actually have the option potentially of having a late arrival twice a week um, if they don't need extra remedial help or support in their Hornet block. Um, okay. All right, well, again, thank you very much for addressing my questions and uh, look forward to part two here. Thank you. Mm. I'm moving on, Ms. Bowman. Yes, um, I just got confused on something. Um, okay. On the slide that shows the Hornet block on the, I think it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then it has grays on the other days. What What is that on the, the non-Hornet days? I understand. So let me just go back to the bell schedule here. So if we look at the bell schedule, um, you can see that on the day where there's a Hornet period, the day begins with Hornet period. Most of students' classes are a little bit shorter for the remainder of the day. Um, but on the right-hand side, where there's a day without the Hornet period, we begin right with block one at the beginning of the day. So that's what that gray means. There may have been a better way for me to illustrate that on that chart. Okay. And then um, I sort of have a la larger question. Um, while we're disrupting things during a disruptive time, thought I'd ask a, a yet another disruptive question about while we're switching to this, was there thought put, I know you have this separate committee about the start time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious um, what the thinking was to either not change it for this year or was there thinking to change it? Um, like, how does that fit into this? Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking that question. So certainly there is a district committee whose um, role is to look at start and end time. Um, we were charged to look at the time, at, at how we use the time that's been allocated to us during that seven hours and two minutes, um, and to make sure that we're using that as effectively as possible, and then be able to bring this um, sort of finished recommendation to that use of, to that um, late start committee that then would be able to consider the beginning and the end of the day. So that was outside of the, the role of this group. Um, what I can say is that looking at the amount of time that's allocated to us, it's pretty consistent in terms of the, the length of our school day with other, with other schools. Um, and uh, we do have some time savings in this new schedule that allows us to implement the Hornet period and allows us to have an advisory every day without losing substantial instructional time from the schedule that we have. What would be very difficult um, and we would have to give up some of those priorities would be if there was any effort to shorten the school day for all students. Um, but nothing in, the, in this plan precludes us from starting at 8.30 instead of 7.30, for example, um, except for all of the sort of logistical considerations that would go into starting and ending the school day later. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. 
Ms. Bowman, if I could just add um, one other comment in response to your, your question about the, the late start time. And I will say that our intention is that um, certainly as we have a better sense of what fall 2020 will bring in terms of our student schedules, that committee will resume now that we have a recommendation from the high school team. I will also share with you that we, we did have some brief internal discussions in terms of the fact that all of our schedules are so disrupted already. Um, is it potentially the time where we just completely rip the Band-Aid off and think about um, you know, our, our start time next year as well? Again, to, to be true to a process, and we, we really did, um, just as the Use of Time Committee had the opportunity to have to receive feedback from parents and community members and to have those small focus groups with conversations. Um, we too wanted to be true to a similar process. Um, so that is certainly very much work that will continue. Um, and as you can appreciate, our initial focus has really been on just fall 2020 and preparing for multiple scenarios. But I do appreciate you bringing up that question. Thank you. Mr. Champagne. Yes, Dr. Kuris, thank you very much. When I when I told my daughters that you were considering a block schedule, they said it was about time, but that they haven't they haven't graduated, so I guess it really doesn't matter. But just really two quick questions, and maybe you'll address one of them in your next section on the uh, program of studies. I, I was curious in your notes that you provided that you said that the curriculum adjustments for the CP and the honors level science classes would be changing, and maybe that's what you'll get into in the next uh, section. Uh, but I'm just want to make sure that we're not going backwards mm -hmm. in, in any of that kind of change and it's really in, enhancing those those courses. Um, so that's my first comment and kind of question. And then second, with respect to LCTI students, you, know, you mentioned that 11th grade students would not be able to participate in the Hornet period. And I guess I have a broader question. Does this block schedule, you know, for those LCTI students who are either going up in for half day in the morning or in the afternoon, will they be able to really get the advantages of the block schedule uh, because they're only in the, 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 the EHS building for a half a day? Uh, thank you. Those are both great questions. Um, yes, I think I think I'll be able to address the science question in the in the presentation on the program of study. But essentially, a lot of that has to do with working a bit more efficiently than than we have in the past. It's typical in a traditional schedule like we've had nine periods to have lab periods that are attached to allow for that sustained. Um, lab instruction. The challenge there is that the lab might not naturally fall on the day that you have a double period in terms of instruction. So it may be that today is the right day for us to really roll up our sleeves and explore this scientific concept, but we don't have lab until day three. So we'll keep moving on and then, and then, and then we'll work backwards. So we think that there's going to be more efficiencies in the way that we're able to deliver um, the the hands-on and have the hands-on activities be more integrated into the day-to-day -day instruction in those courses. Um, it's not typical in a block schedule to have additional labs that are attached, but it is um, not unusual, and you'll see in my recommendation, that in some cases in AP science courses, um, those are afforded a credit and a half or two credits, um, because some of those courses can be very jam-packed with lots of, of pretty detailed labs and content. And so we certainly want to make sure we keep an eye on those courses and don't um, don't cut anything that would be that would be problematic or essential there. Um, and your second question was how the LCTI students yes. you know with the block schedule, how will they get the advantages of it, you know, only being in the in the building for half a day if they, to get to their lab up at LCTI. We think that they will. Um, the majority of our students, the biggest numbers are, are, um, are PM LCTI students. They are with us in the morning and then they go up to LCTI later. Um, and our students need a certain number of classes in our building and they need a certain number of hours in their labs at LCTI. And so that was the sort of dance in terms of looking at our proposal and what was happening at LCTI. Um, it essentially comes out about the same way because if they had four um, traditional blocks in the morning before they would go off to LCTI, now they have two a day 
on adjoining days. And so it allows for them to have about the same amount of time. Interestingly, it does allow us to, um, depending on days where we have Hornet block or where we don't have Hornet block, we're going to be able to put in place an advisory for each of those students, either before they go up to LCTI periodically or when they get back. Um, and that's something that even though some of our students won't be able to participate in the Hornet block, they will have an advisory, which is something we've kind of been sorely missing. And I think one of the challenges we always experience with our LCTI students, because they're bridging those two worlds, is that um, sometimes they don't feel entirely at home at the homeschool and they don't feel entirely at home at LCTI. And so we think incorporating some advisory time for them is going gonna, is gonna to be a benefit. But they will still be able to benefit from the good things about our schedule because they'll only have two classes in our building a day before they go off for their lab um, and it won't disadvantage them in terms of their academic credits to make it to graduation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Curious. I'd like to make a, a quick announcement. Uh, I know we have a lot more uh, public attendance than normal at our in-person board meetings and I see some public have their hands out. Uh, unfortunately, the public comment section of our meeting has already passed. So if you would like to provide input to the board, uh, please send us email. Um, you can find our addresses on the um, on the district website, uh, but we don't really have time for um, additional public comment in the meeting. We have a pretty full meeting. So with that, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Harris, uh, can you continue? Sure. Are you ready for me to move on to the second part here? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. Um, So um, I, I have these recommendations here for you and I've sort of separated them by department, but I'll sort of give you in broad strokes. Um, if we're moving to a block schedule, um, there are some adjustments that we would want to make to a few of our courses in order to really make this work and make the schedule um, as effective for kids as possible. Um, the first change um, is, is, has to do with math. Um, and um, being on the block schedule, we just want to make some adjustments to the kind of the way that we structure additional support. So fundamentals of algebra and algebra one are um, two courses that we offer and some students take advantage of an extra lab period. Um, we don't think we think we will be able for the fundamentals of algebra class. We think that between the block schedule and the intervention during our Hornet period that we will not need the additional lab in the fundamentals of algebra but we want to expand and maintain it with Algebra 1. So some of our students really struggle to get through all of Algebra 1 over the course of the year. They need some additional support. And so we would resequence it so that they would start with, a, with the lab and then they would have um, the course and then they might have additional lab time afterwards. So right now you can imagine that the lab, there's a 41 minute math class and then there's a lab that's attached so that students have that sustained time now. We wouldn't want to put two blocks together where students have 165 minutes of, of algebra. We think that that would probably be counterproductive. So we would just want to resequence the math courses um, so that we're still offering support, but it would be in a different format. Um, and the biggest adjustments here have to do with our science courses. And I've already kind of introduced that in terms of pointing out that in some of our college, some of our college preparatory and honors courses, we have a lab that's attached. So those courses, um, a lot of times credit value is um, traditionally based on seat time. And so because students were, um, had two double labs in a six day cycle, um, those courses are typically worth 1.4 credits instead of one credit. And again, that's typically a function in a, in a traditional schedule. Um, in block scheduled schools, you don't see that same attached lab. So our recommendation would be that for our um, biology one and our biology honors course, our chem one and chem honors course, and our physics CP courses, as well as our genetics and microbiology honors course, that we reduce those courses from 1.4 credits to one credit. Um, courses that aren't listed there, and there are many of them, already are only one credit or a half of a credit. Um, so combined with some adjustments with our wellness fitness department, making these adjustments will also allow us to run a more efficient schedule. You can imagine that when we have a schedule where we have students every day in, in a class and then two days out of the cycle they have a lab, um, sometimes that's that matches up with their, with their gym class, sometimes it doesn't, but it creates a lot of inefficiencies in the schedule that we run and creates blocks for students where they can't schedule another class because they have this lab that's embedded there. Um, so it'll allow us to, to be a bit more efficient in what, we, in what we're doing. Um, 
as far as our AP courses are concerned, we would want to maintain the current amount of instructional time that they have. Um, because of the rigors that are associated with their curriculum. In some cases, for example, so let's talk about AP Chemistry. So our recommendation for AP Biology and AP Chemistry is to actually move them from 1.4 to 2 credits, which would allow us to, um, in some cases, substantially increase um, what they're doing in, in the class um, and have it uh, for the full year. So, or um, have it potentially every day for the full year. Um, so in chemistry, for example, we would take some of the content that now is in our honors chemistry course, which is a pretty packed full course um, for students who take it. We would be able to take some of that content and place it in the AP course. So that's just a curricular adjustment. It's not necessarily reducing over the course of the program the content that the students would get, but it would be placing it into, into the AP course. So we're recommending that AP Biology and AP Chem move from 1.4 to 2 credits and the AP physics courses go from 1.4 to 1.5, which basically maintains them where they are. Um, and that AP environmental science likewise would go from 1.4 to 1.5. Um, and then the other area that we are looking to make adjustments in is our health well fit department. And we're really excited about these because the change allows us to run a more efficient schedule, but it also allows us to accomplish some really important priorities that I know that the board has been interested in and heard about. The first is that right now we have a health course that we offer in 10th grade. It's a half a credit. Um, it's always disappointing to us that we only offer health instruction during one year in high school because certainly I think we all recognize that having healthy relationships, living a healthy lifestyle, um, nutrition, um, CPR, all of those things that we do in health are really important. Um, and only doing them in 10th grade certainly maybe does a disservice to students. And so what we would like to do is to actually break our health course. The other challenge with the health course in 10th grade is that it prevents students from taking other things that they are interested in taking. Um, so what we're recommending is that we break the health course into two pieces that are a quarter of a credit each. One would be taken in ninth grade and match up with their, with their PE class, and the other would be taken in 10th grade and match up with their PE class. It would allow, again, for that efficiency in scheduling to make a 0.5, um, and it would also allow us to deliver health instruction in both years. Right now, we, we steal some time from wellness fitness to do some of those health topics in ninth grade. Um, and the other change that we're recommending that we make um, is, um, is a, an adjustment to our driver education course. And this, of course, also involves some discussion with our, with our union leaders as far as um, what this looks like. But um, we also have a quarter of a credit driver education course, which, as you know, is a graduation requirement for students. Um, but it also can get in the way for many students. Some students choose to take it over summer school and pay for it because it gets it out of their schedule and allows them to take another course. Um, we see an opportunity here to, um, for most of our students, allow them to take driver education as an online course. It's pretty straightforward in terms of its content and curriculum. It's very um, straightforward in terms of what you need to learn. You've got to be able to pass that driver exam. Um, we would love to be able to say that all of our students were able to take an online course before they graduated from high school as just sort of a skill that we think students are going to need to have. We certainly would still offer sections of driver ed in face-to-face -face for those students academically whose academic needs require them to take a face-to-face -face version. Um, but so for the teachers, it would be a part of, it would be built into their schedule during the school day where they would be uh, monitoring the students, um, but the students, it would be scheduled outside of their day. So they could work on it during advisory, they could work on it during Hornet Block, they could work on it during study hall, they could work on it on their own time, but it would not block out their ability to take an elective that they were interested in or another course during the day. That black screen means that was, that was the end. So there are not substantial changes, but all of these changes would be necessary in order for us to implement the block schedule as we've envisioned beginning in the fall. I'll open it up for questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Champagne? Yeah, could, Dr. Kears, could you um, just go back through how the chemistry honors class is changing? Because you mentioned that some of the content will now be shifted into the AP um class and i'm just again i'm trying to make sure that we're not diluting what is being you know if, if somebody does not choose to go on to the ap level mm -hmm. of, of the sciences that they are still getting the rigor that the current chemistry honors or any honors 
science class provides them mm -hmm. and not losing out by not by choosing maybe not to go on to the AP level. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of things there. First, um, we definitely need to take a look at um, how the efficiencies that we're able to find in the way that we're handling labs is going to impact things. So we're not going to just sort of take a scalpel to our curriculum and, and make significant modifications until we get to see what this looks like in practice and talk about the practical implications. Um, but we think that there's an opportunity. There may also at some point, and this is down the road, but there may also be some opportunity for students to go right into chemistry AP without honors being a prerequisite. So some students who show an aptitude might be able to take that two credit AP course in lieu of an honors class. That's one possibility that we certainly will discuss as a department. Um, but making that, because making that AP um, chemistry course two credits is really going to allow for an even deeper dive than they're taking right now. That's a very, very rigorous and challenging um, exam as it is. So we think that they need a substantial amount of time. But there may be opportunities for us to take some of the most sophisticated concepts that we get into in the honors course that really aren't prerequisites for physics, that really aren't prerequisites for genetics and microbiology honors, for any of the other you know, life science or other science courses that students might be taking before they graduate. Um, the honors chemistry course is packed and it is, it's a bit different than this, than the college prep level course. Um, so I think we would be able to maintain most of it, but we would want to make some adjustments so that it isn't, it isn't too packed for students to benefit from it. The nice piece in an honors course, ideally, as opposed to an AP course, is that you can go deeper because you don't have that AP test looming over you. And so I think I'd, I'd certainly like, I want to make sure that we're not just marching students through curriculum either, that we're, we're going deep and, and wide and giving them those opportunities to really explore concepts in, in depth. So that's what we would be looking to do. I, hope I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I guess I just want to, you know, reemphasize my concern that mm -hmm. we don't dilute something, you know, and then, and push to the AP level course, and I, re I recognize that, that that course is very rigorous, and you know, many students choose to go that route, but there are a number of students who feel that the honors level is the level that they want to stop at, and to, to take away things that are currently in the program, I, I just feel like that is not what we should be doing at this time. I think if, if anything, uh, we should be trying to encourage kids to you know, take a more difficult course, um, but at the same time, not put the, if they're not ready for the AP level or choose not to go to the AP level, they, they're not, you know, getting a you know, kind of watered down version of, or just a, 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 you know, a slightly better version than the CP level. I, I, did, I, I think there's a place for honors courses, and I just don't want to see us, you know, lose ground in that way. Appreciate that. I'm not suggesting that we water the course down, but simply that we uh, maintain its rigor, and, but look at the concepts that we're covering um, and make sure that we're covering the things that are really essential and most meaningful for students. Um, I don't think that 1.4 to 1 is going to, like I said, going to result in enormous cuts to the honors course, um, but it will, it will result in us needing to revise the things that, that we cover. Um, and I'm certain that our teachers are up to the task to look and make sure that there is still a substantial level of rigor in that course that's consistent with offering it at an honors level. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Levinson. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is about the, uh, the health class. Um, again, normally it's taken as, as one, one full class, now it's gonna be split up. Mm -hmm. um, how do you envision running the health class for the Summer Learning Academy and it's going to be taught also in two different parts. So if somebody needs one, they can take the one or um, it will be taught all at once or, or how do you envision that working? So this year, those students who are taking health will take the half credit version um, because they'll still be working their way through. We hadn't really talked about how we would offer it in Summer Learning Academy. I think we could offer it in two parts. It's possible that we could offer it um, you know, 
students, we could possibly offer the opportunity for students to take both of them. But the reason that it's nice is because it's, if, if they don't take it during the year, they're just going to have a hole in their schedule around PE that won't allow them to necessarily take anything else anyway. So I'm not sure that it'll really benefit students to take it in the summer the way that it has up till now, because that 10th grade year is so packed, a lot of students take it to get it out of the way. Right, right. I guess you kind of answered my next question was, was you know, 11th and 12th graders will then, they'll just have a hole in their schedule uh, with, when they're taking wellness and fitness. They'll still take a quarter of a credit wellness fitness until we, until we cycle the groups through and up. Okay. Well, so, uh, but then, the, but then the, the, the other day would be a study hall for them or something, right? The other thing we've talked about is perhaps offering the opportunity for juniors to take two um, and free up some time in their senior year schedule to oh, do right. dual enrollment or yeah. internships or those kinds of things. So the long-term plan involves perhaps giving some students the opportunity to double up junior year and then um, either take PE as an elective senior year or make room in their schedule to do some of those other things. Okay. Yeah, it'd just be nice to for them to be able to use uh, use the time for something productive as opposed to, to, to just, a, as you said, a whole. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you, Dr. Kiris, and your team. Uh, there's clearly quite a bit of work uh, going into the block scheduling and the updated programs of studies. Um, I have, uh, I guess, uh, other side of a question uh, um, related to the, uh, the AP classes, some of them going from 1.4 to two uh, units, uh, will that, I haven't seen how a sequence will lay out, but will that uh, limit some students that want to take a heavily STEM uh, high school experience from fitting all the classes in, because now they're, some of them are more units, or will some of the classes going from 1.4 down to one free up the time so they'll be able to take uh, similar numbers of uh, AP, for example, uh, science courses. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a combination of both and it really depends on the individual student and some of the other courses that they're taking. Um, you know, as you've pointed out, some of the courses like biology and chemistry that become one credit allow students to have some opportunities in their schedule that they didn't have before because they don't have that point four attached. Um, additionally, the driver ed change, the health change, all of these things are actually going to open up um, time in students schedules, especially during that sophomore year where everything is sort of so congested. Um, so yes, yeah, some students will need to make choices as they always do. Um, as you know, we only require students to take three science yeah. courses, but we have many students who graduate having taken six, seven, eight, nine of them. Um, and we're really proud of the course offerings that we offer in science. So students will have to make choices as they always have. Um, but we think that moving these to two credits is going gonna, is gonna to give us the best chance of students feeling it, being able to cover that curriculum and being as successful as possible. So it's going to be a mixed bag and it really depends on the student. But I, ultimately, over a four-year four approach, we think that it'll, it'll probably come out. Thank Similarly, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Levinson, is that another question? Yes, to, just just to clarify, when you're moving the, the AP Bio class to two credits, is that still one block, or are you now taking two blocks? Uh, so, if it's two credits, it would be every day for the year, as opposed to every other day for a year. Okay, is that would that potentially crowd out? Or, like you said, they're going to have to make make. make uh, Make a choice then. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiris. Uh, we can move on to the, I guess, the next presentation. Okay. Mrs. Campbell, do you want me just to roll into it? Uh, I think Linda was going to do the introduction anyway. Are you going to show the presentation? I am. We'll okay. let Dr. Kiris take a drink of water because you've, <laughs> you've been on for a while now. I'm feeling popular. I just have to make <laughs> sure that I get this working. Um, okay. Okay. 
So good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Harris and I welcome this opportunity uh, to present the Mace High School Targeted Support Improvement Plan for 2021. Um, in addition to cyclical comprehensive support, the Every Student Succeeds Act requires states to annually designate schools for targeted support. It's important to know that this is a locally managed uh, cycle of school improvement that requires school board approval. And the plan does not require direct oversight from the Department of Education or our IU program or our IU unit. Um, in November of 2019, the district was notified that uh, Emmaus High School is in targeted school improvement. And the population of students who qualify EHS for this designation are our students with disabilities. And so this designation occurs when a subgroup of 20 or more students meets a specific two-step criteria. And when achievement for the subgroup is at or below the statewide average rate of 48.4% for math and ELA combined, uh, for EHS, this achievement uh, result is generated by the Keystone exams. And if the subgroup falls within a specific uh, achievement academic growth profile, that includes both achievement and growth as measured by uh, the Pennsylvania Value Added ass uh, Assessment System, which is PBOS. Um, our subgroup met step one criteria, and so then we move on to step two. And so in step two, the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, ESSA has required indicators and state selected indicators. So the ESSA required indicators are the adjusted cohort graduation rate for high schools and progress in moving English language learners to proficiency. Uh, the state selected indicators are regular attendance and career standards benchmark. So the first indicator is achievement and growth uh, in ELA and math for the 1819 school year. So our students with disabilities exhibited achievement um, at or below the statewide average achievement of 48.4%. And so our proficiency rate was 19.73 for math and ELA combined. And our PVOS rate was less than 10, and it's at a negative 2.72. So our goal for this uh, indicator is to develop and enhance the education and instructional programs in math and ELA to improve performance of students at EHS. And so with that goal requires some action steps. And so during the 1920 school year, we have identified three structural action steps that needed to be addressed in order to implement all of the action steps that were provided uh, to you in the plan. So the first one is a comprehensive revision of English language arts curriculum for grades nine through 12. We also had a review um, and revision of our inclusive practices uh, for students with disabilities. And for the 2020-21 school year, uh, we are going to implement a block intensive scheduling that offers an intervention period and a remediation for students with disabilities. Okay, so I'll be picking up with the second indicator. So the second indicator that we um, fell below target on was our graduation rate. Now it's important to note that this is a lagging indicator. So this is all part of the future ready index, which I know Mr. Pobolitis has provided a presentation for you on certainly last year and this year. And so a lot of these indicators are different than what we used to be in our school performance profile. Um, this is a lagging indicator. So this is a graduation rate for the students um, who would have graduated in 2017-18. So it's not last year's data, it's actually the year before that. Um, it includes both the four and five year graduation rate and it's calculated by looking at all the students who started school and who started high school in a particular year and how many of those students graduated within either four or five years from the time that they matriculated to the high school. So during 17-18, only 76% of our students with disabilities at the high school completed their studies within that four and five year window. Um, 
uh, when we tracked these students, some of them ultimately did drop out of school. Um, others continued their education at Emmaus High School, which they are legally entitled to do until the age of 21 under their IEPs and graduated. Um, and others still, uh, still others later transferred to other schools or other programs. Um, so it's important to note that this isn't a dropout rate, it's a graduation rate um, as measured by that cohort. Um, and our goal certainly is to increase our, our four, four and five year graduation rate for students with disabilities while still honoring their IEP goals and their transition plans. Um, our action steps include, um, you know, there's a theme here, um, implementing our new revised master schedule, which allows for some block and intensive scheduling and again allows us for time to deliver targeted interventions, both academic and behavioral interventions, which are really important when we're, when we're considering the factors that lead to students potentially uh, not finishing on time. Um, we've begun implementing this year, we implemented a um, much more enhanced emotional support program and services that are available at Emmaus High School along with the AIM program. So that's certainly a, 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 an action step under this. And then third, the board continues, thank you very much to support um, the partnership that we have with communities and schools. And as you know, um, our uh, communities and schools uh, site coordinator works with um, some of our most at-risk students and their families to help get, keep them on track toward graduation. The third indicator is, the atten is attendance rate. Again, this is a lagging indicator, so this is 1718 data as well. And this measures chronic, what they call chronic absenteeism, which is students who missed more than 10% of enrolled school days across the academic year, which represents 18 in a 180 day school year. It's very important to note that this includes absences that are excused as well as absences that are unexcused. So this isn't the same as a truancy rate, but it's an indicator that, um, that, that the state has identified as certainly regular attendance is very important for student achievement. Um, our regular attendance rate for students with disabilities was 85.01 and the target is 85.1. So our goal is to improve regu the regular attendance rate for our students with disabilities at the high school. Um, and our action steps include um, partnering with families to reinforce the importance of regular attendance um, on student achievement. Um, providing resources and services, which includes um, regular attendance monitoring by school staff, which would include um, our case managers for our students with IEPs, our administrators, our counselors um, to monitor student attendance patterns. Um, scheduling, offer some schedule and program adjustments. So sometimes we have success just working with a family. Sometimes there's a barrier and it has to do with a, a physical ailment that a student has. And so making an adjustment to their schedule that allows them to come in a bit later in the morning can help improve their attendance significantly. Um, in other cases, sometimes students need to participate in our online program in order to uh, you know, manage the challenges that they're experiencing. Um, so just really looking at what schedule or program adjustments we can make for individual students to help them. Certainly reviewing, having our case manager review and consult with students and their families. And then we also have a pretty detailed district um, plan already in place that involves intervening when the absences are due to truancy. And so we would just continue to implement our truancy prevention plans that we already have in place at the high school. Um, and then again, continuing to um, implement interventions and support through our partnership with communities and schools for those students who um, participate in that program. And then the last indicator is the career studies, is the career standards benchmark. Um, this is a challenging one. Um, it's wonderful and we have really great things in place um, relative to career awareness for our students. And so this, is a this has been a disappointing indicator for us because it's something that we work really hard on and we do a lot of activities in class as well as outside of the, the formal classes for students. But there's a, a portfolio that students are supposed to be keeping, that they are keeping, where they have to provide um, eight pieces of evidence over the course of their high school career that demonstrate readiness for college and careers. Um, and uh, last year, uh, we had 78% of our students um, have that portfolio completed to show that evidence. Um, and we need to be above 87.3. So it's a simple goal and it's one that we're working hard on to make sure that um, we have those career portfolios completed for all of our students. And the way we're gonna do that is to continue the career awareness activities that are part of the K-12 counseling plan. We're gonna incorporate some of them into our advisory, which we think is gonna be really helpful. 
Um, and we're also going to, uh, we're working with our Office of Curriculum and Instruction to identify specific assignments that students do within their regular curriculum. And um, as soon as they finish that English report on, um, on a career that they're interested in, put that right into the portfolio. So um, some of this is, is not necessarily about whether we're providing these learning experiences for students, it's just about um, documenting them appropriately in this career plan. And so we, we think that these three activities will help us get there. Um, so just to share with you our timeline and our process, in November and December, we were notified of our status. Um, in January through May, the Office of Special Ed and the high school leadership engaged in an analysis of the indicators, discussing our priorities, looking at what was already underway and what we needed to move on in order to improve these indicators and develop our improvement plan. In May, we reviewed this plan with our central office team. Today, we're presenting it to you. Um, and then um, it will be a, an agenda item on June 22nd for you to hopefully approve our plan um, so that we can um, you know, continue. Some of these things are already underway and others will, will be um, reinforced or, or implemented in the fall. And again, this is a locally managed process. So you would approve the plan and then we would post it on our website and we would be working on it. It's an annual designation. So year to year, we may or may not be an improvement, but you can see this isn't a one-year plan. It's a sustained uh, approach that we want to take over however long it takes to get where we need to get for our students with disabilities. Um, that's, that's it. Okay, uh, questions for uh, Dr. Kiris and Dr. Pekarik. Uh, Dr. Levinson. Yes, thank you for that presentation. Um, so, so each of these four uh, indicators, you know, obviously have their own challenges, but when I look at them, to me, indicator number one seems like it's gonna be the hardest and most challenging to address. Uh, so I guess a, a couple of questions with that, you know, one, how, how likely do you think we're going to be successful here? And do you think this is a fair indicator uh, to, to assess the value of what we're doing? That's a loaded question, Dr. Levinson. <laughs> um, I think it, 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 it is challenging, um, certainly when we're talking about the, the tool that's uh, being used to measure student progress and achievement is a pretty limited tool. It's you know three tests that students are taking. Um, one of which um, many students take before they even come to high school. Um, so it's really limited, as you know, to Algebra 1, Biology, and, um, and uh, English Lit. Um, at the same time, we should be, even when we have um, difficulty achieving um, the, the target that's been set for us in terms of achievement, we should be doing better in terms of growth. So that's why the indicator includes achievement and growth. So we can still have students not, not necessarily hitting the, the the benchmark, but we should be seeing students making more substantial growth in those areas. And that's measured, they look at how the students did on the PSSA in middle school, and they, they develop a projection as to how they should score on those high school tests. And then um, the PBOS measure comes from looking at whether they achieved at the rate that it was anticipated that they would based on their achievement in middle school. Um, and so both of those things indicate that we need to do a better job providing interventions and support. Um, but that's only one piece of it. Um, we've also spent quite a bit of time over the last couple of years in East Penn really looking at our math program K to 12. Um, and those students are continuing to matriculate up to high school after having had very different experiences. Um, than prior students. So uh, having a comprehensive approach to curriculum revision is really a big part of this. Um, our English language arts curriculum is, is going through revision and that, that's part of the plan there. Um, and it really involves taking, um, in a lot of ways, a different approach to English language arts instruction. Um, we also take a, a hard look at how our students are scheduled, how many of our kids with learning disabilities are in a pullout setting as opposed to an inclusion class, and are we able to um, move as many students as possible into an inclusionary setting um, so that they are getting access to the higher level curriculum with appropriate um, supports. Um, so student scheduling is a big piece of that as well. So um, do I think it's the most fair indicator of, of everything that we're doing for kids? Certainly not, but it certainly is a, a benchmark that we need to keep our eye on and we need to keep improving um, the services that we're providing to help get kids there. Okay, thank you for that answer. And I guess my, my next question is just more for my own education. Um, is there a penalty uh, involved 
uh, if we don't meet these within a certain tier time frame. I know this is it's ongoing work. No, there's sort of three tiers of intervention. There's comprehensive school improvement, which is um, for the sort of the lowest uh, performing schools um, in the state. Um, that's the CSI process. And then there's two versions of targeted school improvement. Um, one of them is uh, in, involves oversight from, from PDE and is a, a more sustained inter, uh, engagement. Um, this is a locally managed process and the way they described it to us is it's kind of like an early warning system um, mm -hmm. where uh, it gives us an opportunity to identify a subgroup that's underperforming and to analyze our data and put an improvement plan in place so that we don't end up in, in you know, a, a higher layer. But certainly ESSA is a little bit, uh, less draconian in the in the um, uh, the sanctions than no child left behind was and so uh, my understanding of the focus of, of both of any of these processes is to make sure that at the state and the IU level that schools are getting appropriate support um, to help achieve instructional goals and I'm not aware of any budgetary or programmatic or other sanctions that we would be subject to as a result of involvement in this this process. All right, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Ms. Bowman. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for this presentation. Um, my first question, again, I might be confused. I read these presentations before the meeting and um, I might be getting two of them mixed up. Are English language learners included in this plan or is that a different presentation tonight? We are not in school improvement for the achievement of our English language learners. Um, that is one of the indicators that's included in the test. If you look at this slide, the ESSA required indicators are the adjusted cohort graduation rate and progress in moving English language learners to proficiency. Um, we are not in improvement for that for our EL students at this time. Okay, so our English language learners are testing at an adequate level for Eng English language, sorry, that is not easy to say, English language arts, or is that correct? So that indicator really has more to do with how they score on, on as I understand it, on the state benchmark tests, the WIDA test, which has to do with them um, developing language proficiency. Um, I don't know if Mr. Povolaitis has anything to add sure. to that one. Yeah, you're correct, right? So it's the WIDA that is similar to, uh, it's a test for, to test for language acquisition. And, and so that particular benchmark uh, that for the English learners, they use that um, assessment. Uh, and, that's, and we are not in corrective action because of that. So we're okay. in good shape so far. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. And then the, the, the population of children or students who are, are affected by this, is this, everyone that has an IEP or a 504, or is it a smaller population than that? I'll let Linda answer that one. So it's the students um, that qualify under Chapter 14, which is IDEA. So it's students with disabilities. Okay. So I, th I think your answer to my question is no, it's not everybody with an IEP. Then. Well, it's the students that take the, uh, the Keystone assessments. Okay. That's what that the achievement was based on. Okay. Okay. I think that's helpful. Um, hold on. I had thought I had another one. Um, and then the English language arts that you're looking at revising. Um, we had gotten one revision. Maybe my sense of time might be off, but maybe about a year ago. And what you're talking about here is something different. No, it's the it's the ongoing process, um, and and a lot of that work. I mean, that work is overseen by your curriculum and instruction office. So um, you've had, I think, a series of presentations on, um, you know, sort of at each level, the efforts that are underway to revise the the district wide curriculum in, in English language arts. Um, so it's the same process that you've had presentations on before. Okay. Okay. Great. And then um, last question just has to do with attendance. I was very happy to see that you were looking at caseworkers for that, um, you know, if, it, it's interesting when I chat with parents who have um, kids in special ed or with IEPs, um, and every single one of us has, achieved, has received the attendance letter from the high school that we were um, not so happily refer to as the nasty gram. Yeah. And so I, 
I guess I was wondering about that first action plan step of communicating the importance of attendance. Um, I do wonder whether parents of kids with disabilities don't know that attendance is important, but rather are experiencing pretty severe barriers to getting their mm -hmm. kids to school. Um, in which case, communicating the importance of regular attendance kind of makes families feel like nobody understands what they're going through. And so I'm wondering if that maybe isn't the, it sounds like that's already happening and maybe the case managers would be a lot more helpful there in terms of helping parents manage the five different doctors, none of which will allow you to have an appointment except during school time, for example, uh, lots of other barriers, but that's just one of them. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And, you know, that's why we really tried to kind of use the word partnership with families as opposed to um, send a certified letter. Um, it does put us in an awkward position, though, because, for example, I might have a student who has a medical challenge that through the accommodations that they're eligible for in their IEP is doing phenomenally well academically, but happens to be missing more time than is allowable under that indicator. And so it is a little bit difficult because this is something that sort of counts against us as a building. But if, I'm, if we're partnering with a family and that child needs to attend appointments at top, the last thing we wanna do is sort of hit them over the head with yeah. uh, you know, a reminder that attendance is important. So I really, I really appreciate that point. And I think we will continue to support families. And there are some students with disabilities who are not going to be able to um, meet that benchmark. And that's going to be what it is. But to your point, there are other students and families who are experiencing challenges. And I think we could do a better job of understanding what those challenges are and figuring out how are there program changes or their schedule changes or the things that we can put in place that's going to make it more manageable for a student to come to school on a more regular basis. Yep, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Not sure if I was unmuted, Dr. Munson. Uh, yes, thank you, and and thank you for this information. Um, so I I, I actually um, I have a, a number of of questions, and one I think goes to the very first question that Dr. Um, Levinson had asked about um, uh, you know whether or not the first indicator was a fair indicator, um, and I'll put the question more generally. The, so there are four indicators here. What are they indicators of? Like what, what is it that we're trying to figure out with these four indicators? So the indicator is, a, is part of the language that comes to us through this process from the Department of Education. Um, but you see it, 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 it's referring to it as an ESSA required indicator. So the Every Student Succeeds Act is the most recent evolution of the um, uh, educational, it's the most recent version of No Child Left Behind um, in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And so ESSA is very specific about what indicators were, are supposed to be used to determine whether a school should go into improvement or whether a subgroup is, or, or the entire student population is, is um, achieving at an acceptable level. And so the language of indicator comes from ESSA, and you can see there, um, there are sort of two layers, and the first is um, there are ESSA required ones, and then ESSA allows the state to select some of its own indicators. So the graduation rate and the progress of moving English learners to proficiency comes from the federal law, and then the state's added indicators are the regular attendance and the career standards benchmark. So those are specific to Pennsylvania. So yeah, I, I guess my question isn't where these indicators come from, but what it is they're indicating. Uh, I mean, I, I guess mm -hmm. the closest I understood in, in, in what you were saying is that they're, they're, they are, are, do, are we, do you conceptualize them as indicators of educational achievement? Is this so that educational achievement is determined by how many things they hand in to show that they're career ready and how often they attend? I mean, is that, is that what we're trying to indicate? Or is that what the federal and state authorities are trying to measure? Go ahead, Linda. No, so the first step is really to look at the performance for math and ELA. 
And so if you meet the criteria in step one, which we did, then you move on to step two and it moves into those other indicators. So I think, you know, the, the premise of this is really based on student performance academically, and then it looks at other indicators that potentially may be barriers to students' performance. Okay, I, I think you've actually, you both have been very clear about the process. I'm trying to understand why we're going through this process. And um, I mean, one of the things that I, I find confusing is that we have goals to meet our indicators, but in, you know, in no, I'm sorry, I, I can't even come up with the words. I mean, typically, right, an indicator is something that you use to measure your progress towards a goal. And we seem to have it inversed, right? We start with indicators, and which seem difficult for people to articulate what they're indicating. And then we set, we're setting goals to meet those indicators. So it's, it's, it's like we have the cart before the horse. Like what is it we're trying to accomplish? Well, I think it's safe to say that the indicators are indicators of failure, um, according to state and federal law. Um, and, you know, as Linda said, you know, the first part of this is, um, is student achievement in math and English language arts as measured by those standardized tests. Um, if we meet the criteria in step two, if we didn't have challenges with our cohort graduation rate or we didn't have challenges with regular attendance, we wouldn't be... Um, required to go through this process, but we would still be informed that we have indicators or data points that tell us that we need to improve in that particular um, area. And those are all set at the state and federal level. Okay, hey, sorry, I've got a train. I live in Emmaus, so I have a train going through uh, in my microphone. But um, so then let me let me follow up on a question um, whose the answer to which I did not understand um, that uh, Miss Bowman asked. Um, so the this is a the subgroup that we're talking about is students with disabilities, correct? Right. Yes. So how does that uh, to what extent does that population of students? overlap with the population of students that have IEPs and 504s? It's the same students. So that, okay. So when, when we're talking about students with disabilities, we're talking about students with IEPs and 504s. Linda, is that, it's, you're comfortable with it's that? It's just students with IEPs that take the Keystone exam. Okay. So students with 504s are students with that's another group of students with disabilities that are not included here simply because they don't take the Keystone exam. No, so they're looking at students under chapter 14, which is IDEA, and chapter 15 is the 504 students, the ADA. They all take the Keystones. Okay, so, so, so what it, uh, Perhaps I could ask a question along these lines. Yeah. Is it that a student's IEP would say that they're not, that the keystone is not appropriate for them and so they wouldn't take it or under what conditions would a student in this group not take a keystone exam? We have some students who take the PASA, which is the alternative system of assessment, but that's what percentage of students, Linda, two? Yeah, it's 2%. Mm -hmm. And that's capped at, at that percent. Um, and uh, then we have some students who, through the IEP process, the IEP team has the right to determine that the, that the keystone is not appropriate for them. But my understanding is that um, if they are non-testers, their scores are still, um, their proficiency level um, is counted uh, against us for this indicator. <laughs> Okay, um, so w one of the things that made it really hard for me to understand and evaluate this proposed plan is it, it, it didn't seem to have comparative information to, so, that I, so that I could see what these numbers mean, right? So in, in every case, I wondered, well, what is the number for the general education students? Um, so for example, what is the attendance rate uh, for, general, for the students in general? Um, rather than just students with disabilities. And it, it, it seems to me this is important because it, it speaks directly to what kind of 
actions you would take, right? Whether they would be targeted actions or, or, or more general actions. Mm -hmm. So what is our, what is, like how do students in general do on the career standards benchmark and attendance, right? Like are, are the students in this subgroup, like how, how much different are they, not from this state mandated indicator, but how different are they than the rest of our students on these indicators? Um, I, so I don't have all of that information for you tonight. Um, if you want comparative information to our larger student population, we can certainly share it. Um, those are things that we did discuss in terms of um, uh, whether the intervention that we have in place, um, you know, whether the action that we have in place to support all students is something that also benefits students with disabilities or whether we, whether it's something that we need to take a targeted approach to. So those were certainly parts of our discussion. Um, we're happy to provide any supplemental data that the board would like to see in order to, um, to approve the plan. So you're confident that the actions uh, being taken on these indicators for um, students with disabilities um, need not extend beyond students with disabilities, that, that these numbers are problematic only for these students? No, I wouldn't say that necessarily. I mean, we're in school improvement for this particular group, um, uh, but I think there's always areas that we need to improve um, with our students as a whole. Um, we have, um, we aren't seeing the growth, for example, in English language arts for students as a whole that we would like to see. Um, and so if you look at our future ready index score, you can see that our growth scores for ELA are not where we would like them to be. Um, so that's an example of a, of a, a, an, of a, 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 an action that's listed on this plan that is actually something that we're implementing that would that we believe would benefit all students. And then there are some interventions here that are more targeted specifically to students with disabilities because, you know, to your point, um, not all of these things are just challenges with our students with disabilities. We did not meet the, and for example, with the career standards benchmark, we did not meet that benchmark for all students as a whole either. Um, and so there's, there's room to grow um, you know, in that indicator um, for all of our students as a whole, so. Okay, what about um, the relative importance of these different indicators? We, you know, if you had to rank order these indicators, which, is, which, speaks, which speaks the mo di most directly to how, how we're doing and which is the least important uh, to how we're doing? So to me, it's indicator one. If you look at our growth rate, we're in the negative. And mm -hmm. so they had different tiers um, where you looked at the growth and we were at the bottom tier, obviously, because we're in the negative. So we need to put supports in place to grow our students. So to me, that's problematic. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And what would be number four on this list of four? I think they're all important, but I think the way they're measured is uh, present certain challenges for us. Um, I don't know that I can rank them. I don't know that that's necessarily my role. I mean, this is provided to us by the Department of Education, and so we're, we're to consider all of them important. I think we're putting the most um, emphasis on the academic goals, um, but we're trying to put things that some of them are lagging and so this year will be measured by last year's data that was put in place before we knew that we were in the school improvement plan process so there's a lot of challenges associated with and of course we can't forget that our students didn't even take standardized tests this spring and so yeah. what the future ready index is going to look like going forward you know, no one knows. Um, but that being said, you know, we, we don't look at this as just a compliance exercise. We recognize that, that um, there is room to grow in all of these areas and we wanna make a good faith effort to do that. But I agree with Linda, but I think the most important piece of all of this is the growth. If we were seeing students still under underachieving the overall benchmark in ELA and math, we, um, and, and they were students with disabilities, I would be less concerned if they were making phenomenal growth. The fact that they're not is a problem. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of, of this work. 
Uh, well, let let me um, let let me offer one a possible candidate for um, being ranked last, and I'll okay. give you my reasons, which is the attendance measure. If if you could bring that up on the on the slides, sure. Um, so. <laughs> I had all kinds of questions about this attendance measure. I mean, one is, right, we're, we're one-tenth of one percent off. We are. Well, we're... So, so this strikes me as um, hard to even talk about in the same conversation as indicator one, um, just mm -hmm. because, you know, our relationship to the standard is, is so much different. Mm -hmm. um, number two, uh, it, it, you know, as you, I, I think, usefully described, um, this includes people who are gone for all kinds of reasons, many of which we have no control over. So again, it, it, it's not clear that we should be spending nearly as much time or attention or giving as much importance to this indicator as on the other indicators, um, not because attendance is not important, but because we're already very close and some of the things uh, we can't do much about. Um, and then the final, if you could go to the action, um, the mm -hmm. action steps here. I had a question about these. Wh which of these things are we not currently doing already? So in, in my opinion, the case managers are not really reviewing the attendance data. So they may be notified, but they're not necessarily taking any action. And so we need to improve um, in that arena. Okay. So, I mean, one of the things that would be useful for me, uh, because, I mean, I'm not working, you know, you all are in the trenches doing this difficult work. Um, but when I read a document like this, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to decipher it when I don't know which things are just bullet items that we're already doing and which are actual proposals for change. And it would be useful to know what you plan to change versus what you are using that's already in place that you think will, will help in the future. Um, and I mean, I have some other questions, but it, it, they're more minor. I, I guess just one other thing on, on indicator one. Um, you know, there has been a concerted effort to improve um, uh, some of these uh, numbers, you know, district-wide since I've um, but been in the district. Um, but uh, a lot of it, because the indicators come from standardized tests taken by secondary students, um, there seems to be more attention, at least attention that's brought before the board, on um, making changes at the secondary level uh, to uh, affect these numbers. It seems to me far more powerful and far more effective uh, to meet these challenges at the secondary level at the elementary level because then we're not doing remedial work, we're not trying to catch people up, um, but we're actually um, putting in the foundation um, that, that, that will lead to success. And so as you consider how to improve these numbers, um, I hope that that will extend down, even though we're talking about keystones, um, that that will extend down to what we're doing in grades three, in grades you know, six, and, and, and so forth. So thank you. So Dr. Munson, that is an excellent point, and we have already started that work through our inclusive practices committees uh, district-wide. And so for next year, there will be some changes made at the elementary level where we are including more students. And as I have articulated before, uh, this year we really dissected every uh, students with disabilities, IEP programs, and we looked at um, their present levels of performance. And so we are moving students towards a more inclusive environment, K to 12. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, you know, I, I, again, I don't know because it's not included here. Um, that won't actually help our um, ELA and math scores for anyone but students with disabilities. Uh, but so, so that is useful. Um, but I, I know we've had broader conversations that this is an issue um, that, that transcends this one particular subgroup. Correct. That's all, uh, Dr. Bacher, thank you.
Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Uh, Mr. Champagne? Yes, yeah, just a, a couple of things. I thank you both for this information. And I guess, kind of to echo Dr. Munson's point, I guess what I'm struggling with is if you peel back the, the, the test scores, and maybe you've, you've, you've tried to indicate this, you know, you're not seeing the growth that you hope. And I guess I, one of the things I'm struggling with is, is this a, just an artifact of this particular cohort that happened to be measured at this point in time? And are you, you know, if you really take a look at what's important, and I agree that the academic elements are probably the most important part of, of these indicators and it just in general, but do we believe that this is uh, a systemic problem in our, uh, how we're handling these kinds of students? Or is it simply, you know, we've not identified these students to have issues soon enough. And by the time we get to measuring certain achievements, you know, they're already struggling. And I, and I, I guess I'd like to see if we're gonna kind of bring this kind of information to the board, you know, more than just a single point data, it, it really is hard to kind of, you know, and you have other indicators within the district that I would hope tell you more about where students are headed versus simply these, you know, kind of state and federal mandated ones. And I think to me, that's more important to understand. Are you seeing the kind of results that you want in those indicators or those measures versus simply the measures that we are required to report on. I know that we have to do this and I'm not suggesting it's not, you know, a, 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 some information we should be looking at carefully, but I guess what I'd like to make sure of is we're not just simply trying to, again, meet these and we're then ending up missing other points like Dr. Munson says, which is focusing at the elementary level so we don't find ourselves in a, in a position where we're trying to catch up. So I, I can talk to, are we waiting too long? So the district does have a child find process in place. Um, we have an MTSS model where we're constantly looking at student data. And so if we need to move towards evaluation, we certainly do and there's no lag time there. Um, historically, the district looks at all of our scores. So we're looking at, you know, the PSSAs, we're looking at our PASSA scores, we're looking at Keystone. And so, yes, we have identified some areas that we need improvement. Um, math is one at the elementary level. And so that's just not for students with disabilities. That's, um, you know, all students in third, fourth, and fifth grade. So we are aware that there are some difficulties and we are addressing them. But I guess, Linda, one of the things I'm trying to, I'm still struggling with is, it, you know, it was at this particular cohort that obviously you, you measured and when the state measured it was, was, and if you took a look at what the, the next cohort is doing and how are they measuring on these exams or just in general, and if you did, if you did some more analysis or provided us with some more analysis to show what, what are the trends looking like? Are they negative? Are they positive? Is it, you know, you know because you, you get new students coming in that have disabilities that you hadn't, you know, had to deal with. And so it, it, it kind of makes it more difficult to show improvement. And, and that's what I'm trying to get at, you know, is, is are there things that we're actually being very successful at that aren't reflected here in addition to obviously identifying the areas that we're struggling? And we can cert we'll take a look at that if that's the data that you need moving forward to approve the plan. We can certainly provide that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I had to negotiate with one of my children for their iPad due to my technical difficulties, so I want to make sure I'm, <laughs> I'm audible. Um, I have a, a, a question for my own education and then a couple of comments. Um, thank, thank you, too, uh, for the work you put into this. Uh, it, it's really helpful to understand that what's going on. Um, the fourth indicator, the career standards benchmark, what 
what kind of evidence is required, um, you know, to, to, to meet these targets? And what are, what are students, you know, required to do in accordance with this indicator? So there's a series of options that students can select based on, um, you know, what their post-secondary goals are and based on their coursework. Um, but essentially, it's a lot of different types of, it, it could be anything from so a number of the um, options that are available to them are integrated with our Naviance system. If you're familiar with that, it's a software that we use that allows us to um, handle the uh, college application process and the college search process, but it also has a lot of, um, you know, career and college inventory um, activities that students can complete to get a sense of what their interests are post high school. Um, it might be the development of a resume. It might be um, working on a, a writing assignment where they're exploring a career. It might be a shadowing opportunity where they go and, you know, shadow someone and then they do a reflection on it. So there's lots of different options that students can select um, and are, and they're all outlined in our K-12 counseling plan, um, which is kind of where a lot of this career readiness work lives um, but it uh, some of them are quite can be quite simple and some of them can be quite involved so they certainly are differentiated for students based on their interests and abilities okay thank you that, that's helpful because and our you know, career and technical students do it all at LCTI I should add that as well they're 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 in good shape so we're, we're almost you know 10% below B below the uh, the target and, and you know my question is you know it says you know one of the action steps is more you know continue awareness activities a and so my question is you know is this responsibility fall on the counselors and and the teachers or the students themselves like who's really responsible for making sure that these students is this really something that you know we're expecting the students on their own or or you know and, and, and to that point, why why is this one so far below? Like, what hasn't been done, um, and why is there such a you know why are we still you know below the target? It's a combination of both. So it it is something that has lived primarily with our counselors, although something that we've been we've worked to embed more in students' actual coursework. Um, it our. I think what was disappointing to us, so in some school districts, students just take a course, say a ninth grade career exploratory course, and all of this work is embedded in that course and they knock it out and they put it together and the, the district indicator is good. Um, we worked really hard to identify things that students were already doing across their courses that were meaningful and related to careers. I think students are doing these things. A lot of this has to do with the record keeping aspect of it, which is um, nightmarish in some ways for classes of 700 and 750 students, um, tracking the portfolio, making sure that they're entering those pieces into the portfolio when they're completing them, following up with those students. Um, so on a, to, to truly, a lot of this is record keeping, and I think it's going to be relatively simple for us to improve this indicator just simply by having a more streamlined approach to A, incorporating these um, directly into courses that students are taking and be having more opportunity for them um, as overseen by their counselors and their um, their homeroom teachers to be doing some of this in advisory. So I don't think it's for lack of students having access to opportunities to explore careers. It's just a, a very difficult process to gather all of them in a portfolio and the students ultimately are because it doesn't live in any one course right now, the students ultimately are responsible and reminded on a very regular basis to update those artifacts and evidence. But we haven't gotten to where we need to be with the record keeping side of this. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of to, to, to what, you know, Mr. Champagne was just talking about and, and you know, whether there's a pattern with certain students, um, you know, I'd be interested in seeing where, with respect to indicator two and three and, you know, the attendance and graduation, where we were standing, um, I mean, I think attendance, you really have to look at it through March 17th because, you know, it, under these certain circumstances, you know, I guess a student could log on at home and not do anything but kind of be credited with attendance. So I'd be curious, though, to see where we were trending this year on attendance up until the, the closure 
and, and maybe even, you know, based on, on the patterns, you, you could estimate what, what had we had a full school year, what, what the remainder of the year would have been. And then I'd be interested in seeing what our graduation rate is this year. Um, and whether you think, you know, the, the, the closure, school closure has any impact on that, either negatively or, or, or positively. Um, so the data reporting, where... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the data reporting for a lot of this is challenging. Um, so you can mm -hmm. see that like for attendance rate and graduation rate, again, these are lagging indicators. So this is 1718 data. Um, yeah. it, we can now give you 1819 data, but it, it, this is all linked to our um, very involved PIMS reporting process where, you know, we have a person in the district who, you know, pulls those numbers and reports them to PIMS. So, um, on a certain timeline. Um, so some of these indicators are easier than others to sort of get those kinds of, you know, real, real time snapshots. Um, but we can certainly do a better job of, of getting you at least last year's data to see um, did things change between 1718 and 1819 that would tell us this was kind of a blip on the radar. Um, and again, we're all adjusting to these, these indicators as the new indicators because the future ready index is we're only really in like the second year of implementation of this whole new system of measuring uh, achievement. So I think we'll get better over time um, at, at looking at these indicators through a longitudinal lens. I don't know if Mr. Povolaitis would add anything to that. No, I agree. Um, as we look at each year, um, as you're aware, um, we've, we've looked at the Future Ready Index and right around October-ish when it comes out and we present all the data and lay all the district data out there, strengths and weaknesses for the board to see. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. Um, overall, um, you know, we have goals in place and we, we hope to see a, a trend, but it's a little bit too early to kind of see where we are as far as where things, especially with this year. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic that we're headed in the right direction. Um, I know there are some great questions about the elementary level. We have goals and action plans in place mm -hmm. at that level. And so um, we're optimistic that uh, the future is bright. Yeah, I mean, I think that also really help, it would be helpful information with respect to the action steps and, and what level and depth of steps you, you need to take, if, you know, depending on where the trend is going from you know, two years ago. Um, and then just my final comment, uh, you know, a couple of my other colleagues on the board had, had mentioned this, and I, I think it's important, you know, to note again that, you know, while, while I think it's important that we focus on the disabled students too, I think all of these indicators and all these steps in one way or another, are important to impact all of our students, mm -hmm. and, and I just hope that we're we're applying these same steps, uh, you know, for for the benefit of all of the student body. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Jankowski. I have uh, well one question, but then a a, a preliminary uh, informational question. My understanding for things like growth, we're not looking at the same students one year to the next, we're, we're looking at the people that happen to take the keystones one year and comparing them to the people that took the keystones the previous year, or how do we get growth out of, out of a particular cohort? No, we are looking at those individual students, um, and uh, it's it's a it's an indicator that looks at how they did on the middle school assessment, and then projects how they should do on the high school okay. assessment, and then and then tells us how we're doing um, comparatively. So it isn't apples to oranges, one cohort to the next. Okay, so it it is the same students, but it's two different tests. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then uh, my main question is, uh, and I think it's been touched on by a number of the other directors, but how do we balance uh, the sort of ESSA indicators, which are something from the state and um, federal government versus uh, say progress on a student's IEP, which is something that we've sort of come up with with the parents and the educators as this is what the student's progress should be. And how do those numbers compare like growth rate on the test versus progress along an IEP in general? Are they correlated or are they just measuring different things? They're actually measuring different things. And so uh -huh. a student's goal may not be on grade level. And so we're kind of measuring the student from where they are at a baseline and we're projecting growth on like a target and a goal. 
So they're, they're two different things, but we are moving towards the same goal, and that is to have proficiency um, in that general education curriculum and content. Okay, so, okay, so, okay, they're measuring different things. Okay, um, do we have any other questions for the uh, improvement plan? It does not look like it. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, the generosity of your time tonight. Oh, I see uh, Mr. Champagne, is that a new hand up? No, okay. Thank you, can we uh, move on to the next pre presentation? Okay, thank you for that, that brief little intermission while we switched screens. Uh, this evening, um, one of our, our presentations that we certainly know that the board, as well as I'll say, I recognize that our entire school community is very much anticipating or looking forward to the fall of 2020, as we all are. And while we've certainly been having our foot in two worlds, so to speak, in terms of wrapping up the current school year, I can assure you that our administrative team has also been busy planning for fall of 2020 for several weeks. In addition to our dist district planning team, we also have district representatives who participate on the CLIU task force that is actually planning for the reopening of Lehigh County Schools. So that's another great collaborative opportunity for us. Just last week as well, many of you are aware of the fact that the Pennsylvania Department of Ed also released preliminary guidance on the phased reopening of schools. And so we, just like PDE, recognize that our plans must be fluid and responsive to ongoing changing guidelines from the CDC as well as other state agencies. And we're also very committed to being responsive to feedback from our community as well. The goal of our presentation this evening is to provide the board and the community with an overview of the various scenarios for which we're planning for our students to return in the fall. And I also wanted to share with the community that tomorrow we will be releasing this evening's presentation to the entire public. Um, and we also have a video to accompany the presentation and also a community survey that will be administered again tomorrow. And that survey will be live for a week. And we'll talk more about the survey at the end of the presentation. So before we jump into the modes of instruction for which we've been planning, we wanted to share that there are, there are multiple criteria that have been guiding, that have guided our decision making throughout the process. In particular, we are very cognizant of the importance of delivering an East Penn academic program that reflects our core beliefs about teaching and learning. We also are very well aware of the safety, the importance of safety and wellness of our students as well as our staff. And as you can appreciate, we certainly have to follow state and federal health guidelines that are in place. And then finally, we recognize that as families in the East Penn community, all of us are in unique situations at, in our homes. And so equity and accessibility in learning are critical for all of our students. So when we think about the three possible modes for which we've been planning for the upcoming school year, I wanna provide the board with a brief or a high level overview of those three different modes. On the far left of your screen is the traditional mode. 
And this is, this is very likely the format with which we're all most familiar. This would be students receiving face-to-face -face instruction in all 10 of our school buildings. On the far right, we've also been preparing for the scenario in which students may have to be continuing or learning remotely, meaning that all students are learning from home using online coursework. And when I mention this, I also want to point out the fact, and um, in just a few minutes, you'll hear from Laura Whitman and Doug Povolitis, who will also emphasize that when we talk about remote learning and our plan in the event that, we, that our students are learning from home next year at the beginning of the year, that does not mean that we are simply rebooting what we've been doing this spring and offering that same online learning next fall. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those differences between what we've offered as part of our continuity of learning plan and how we envision online learning next year would look differently. So we have traditional format, we have a possible remote format, and then in the center is the middle, um, or a hybrid, I should say. And that is, of course, um, elements of both a traditional face-to-face -face instruction at school. As you can appreciate, again, there are re certainly restrictions or social guidelines, social distancing practices that we must adhere to. And then in, in conjunction with those traditional in-school instruction, there is also then a blend of remote instruction happening as well. So that hybrid really is a scenario in which students are with us in our buildings some days of the week, and the days when they are not with us, they are then at home um, learning online. And the reason that they would not be with us all days, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as well, is because of the fact, again, we recognize that in buildings as large as 2,800 students at Emmaus High School, we certainly could not safely adhere to all um, health and safety guidelines and have all students in the building at the same time. The other piece that we recognize is that it's important that we continue to be prepared for all three scenarios and also that our models and our approach continues to be flexible as we may have to adjust our model based on changing health guidelines. So what I mean by that is we certainly recognize the reality that we may say students are returning in the fall um, in, a, in a hybrid format, receiving some traditional as well as remote learning. And then the situation of our state may change and there is a possibility that schools may have to close again and we would have to then shift or adjust to fully remote. And so the importance for us um, is very much on being flexible and fluid and recognizing that not only as an organization, we are at different points of this continuum, but also that individual families may be at different points as well. Okay, so taking a look, um... At, as Mrs. Campbell mentioned, if we are in a remote setting, things will, will look different than the spring. And so this slide is to try and point out the, the key differences. Um, so where we are right now and where we're finishing up um, is definitely different from what we're planning for if we have to be in the remote setting in the fall. Some main examples at the elementary level, we will in the fall have increased face time with teachers um, in that remote setting. That will mean more instructional time and of course more time for small groups with students and we hope improved learning. Additional structures in the day with very targeted specifics on uh, for each subject area, uh, goals for each subject area, activities for each subject area, and a targeted focus for each of those. We will have more formalized grading. At the elementary level, we did not have formalized grading in the third trimester. And so moving forward in a remote setting, we would have that in place. Um, and then we will have grade level specific content for elementary learners. So um, this year there were a few, um, there were a few activities that were kind of a grade span activities. Um, although there were some, you know, different outcomes expected, it, is, it won't be that way in the fall. It'll be very targeted and specific to each grade and content. Um, as far as what we're ex expecting. The secondary level, there are a few key changes from the continuity of learning plan this spring. Um, regardless of mode, all secondary teachers will be migrating their content from Google Classroom to Schoology. That's a more robust learning management system that integrates with PowerSchool, our new student information system. Um, 
the remote instructional minutes will be equal to the face-to-face -face instructional minutes or the in-person instructional minutes that we would have if we returned in traditional form. One of the things that we are considering, and Dr. Karras mentioned this, is that we may consider more intensive scheduling at Emmaus High School if needed, if we find that we are going to open in pandemic mode. Um, and when I say that pandemic, meaning that hybrid mode where we're still following guidelines that look very similar to what we have right now. So we're not committing to this on June 8th, but what that means is we would move into a like four by four traditional block where students, where their A courses, she talked about an a, a B block where they were rotating. The students would take all of their A courses in the first semester and the students would take all of their B courses in the second semester. And what that would allow is the teachers would have a lighter load and the students would have a lighter load during that first semester. One of the things that we are, um, returning to his traditional grading and traditional reporting. And there will be an advisory period at Emmaus that we had mentioned earlier. That is a non-academic period that functions as a touch point for teachers and students in any mode. And we have that at period nine at the middle school. What stays the same is that there will be continued flexibility for families and students. So what you see here is the initial pr uh, proposal for the hybrid learning that reflects the CDC and state guidelines for the high school. At the high school, because of our size, we need to divide the high school into quarters. So we're going to stick with the traditional time of the day, but we will have that combination of in-person and remote learning. So what you see here is students whose last name ends in A to E will attend on Mondays. Students whose last names end in F to K will attend on Tuesdays. Wednesday would be an e-learning day or a day where all students and teachers are focused on their remote learning. Students would not be reporting physically to the school on that day. Thursday would be a face-to-face -face or in-person day for students' last names L to R, and Friday would be S to Z. And then when students are not in face-to-face, -face, they would be wor working on the remote learning that their teachers are providing. What you see in the middle school is that we are dividing them in half based on current guidelines. And so again, we're keeping students together um, one of the other big functions of this plan was looking at the different levels and keeping students together by last name by families, no matter if their student was in the high school, middle, or elementary. And so what you see are students A to K are attending on Monday and Tuesday, students L to Z are attending Thursday and Friday, and Wednesday is an e-learning day for all students and teachers. Students would not be reporting to school on that day. On the days they're not face-to-face, -face, the students would be working on the remote learning. So the elementary proposal um, is a little bit different than high school and middle school. Our elementary team uh, met and discussed this, and we felt that the elementary learner being a little bit different, um, that it was important for them to have as much in-person uh, contact as possible. But at the same time, in a hybrid model, of course, there'd be remote expectations for them as well. So what does that look like? So we felt like a nine to one fifteen day early dismissal every day, and there would be some students in the building every day. So what, what does this look like? So in person on Monday, students with the last name A through K, and then on Tuesday, A through K. So they come two days in a row. Wednesday, they alternate. Then Thursday, it flips. And so the students in person are the students that were in the remote setting on Monday and Tuesday. So that's the last names L through Z. So what does this do? Um, They're dismissed early at 115 so that there can be that touch point for the remote learners every single day. And the elementary teachers would have the opportunity to work um, remotely for planning um, and interacting with students at the elementary level that need that interaction on a regular basis instead of just one drop day. So that was the, the thought behind that. Um, and the 115 time um, works with the, with the busing. As far as lunches and recesses, we, we talked about a lot of this. At this point, our proposal right now um, would be that lunch would be served at the very end of the day and students would take the lunch with them. It's, we've discussed it at length and it would be important for us to provide snacks and make sure the students are, are not hungry throughout the day, uh, of course, but this may, it's the safest plan that we can put together in working with our nutrition staff that if we would have like almost grab and go lunches for the students to leave the day with. We'd start to deliver them 
around 12, 1230 to each of the homerooms. They leave, get on the bus and take it with them, take their lunches home with them. Um, and so what this does is provides more instructional time and it also limits the interaction during the lunch time if there are those safety precautions that we have to make sure we put into place. Um, with recess, it would not look like our traditional recess. Recess would be different. It might be in the classroom, um, brain breaks, and some little activities that are done um, with students um, moving around and doing some things in a safe way without interacting and staying at that um, if we need to, the social distancing protocols that are in place at that time. Um, so the, the question earlier about re uh, recess, at this point, it may not happen the way traditional recess happened. And of course, as we said before, this is fluid and could change at any time. Specials, we're planning for all levels of specials. Um, will specials happen this, the same way they normally do? Um, could there be an abbreviated or a shortened special area time? Um, would it look different where special area teachers are coming to the classroom so students aren't moving and going anywhere? And, and then that gets adjusted. All these things are options at this point. Um, and we really don't know exactly what it looks like, but we're gonna prepare for all of that. Um, so I hope that that answers some of the questions that, that were out there. So in addition to the criteria, we shared at the beginning of the presentation, we recognize that a hybrid schedule presents a new challenge for our families. Therefore, a major consideration of going on Monday and Tuesday, your elementary student would be going on Monday, Tuesday, and alternating Wednesdays. And that's what it would look like for a family that probably from the, the state and national level. Um, so when when do you anticipate just ballpark if we don't have an actual date when do you anticipate us needing to have a uh, an official vote on on this and i ask doug and laura to certainly um feel free to to add feedback as well our timeline is that we certainly think by um, by a July meeting, we would love to be able to provide parents with some more definitive information regarding our plans for the fall of 2020. At the latest, I would say we would be looking for a vote from the board by our first meeting in August. Okay. Um, so just my, my thoughts uh, on this, and I'm sure my colleagues are going to share their own as well. Um, first, just looking at the number of attendees that we have here tonight, um, it's very obvious that this is uh, certainly a, a hot button issue for a lot of folks. Um, and when I'm looking at the three options and I look at the two extremes, um, both 100% you know, face to face and 100% virtual, um, personally, I, I don't like either one of those options. And so that's, that's part of my um, my reason for thanking, uh, you know, appreciating the fact that we're not going to have to vote on this um, for at least a couple more board meetings to give us some time to to really digest everything here. Um, and and when I say I don't um, I don't like either option, um, it's because there are so many factors that are at play. And and I think, you know, I, I imagine that some of what I'm about to say um, has already been discussed. Um, behind the scenes uh, at the administrative level to, um, you know, come up with a plan of what this might look like. Um, so, so hopefully, you know, sharing my thoughts can provide some of that insight, um, not having been a part of that myself. You know, so on one hand, um, you know, the concerns about face-to-face -face instruction, um, you know, going back to the way things were, you know, three months ago, four months ago, um, there are a lot of, um, concerns that um, folks have in the community about, you know, uh, health outcomes that, um, you know, still, you know, things, information comes so quickly and it's so fluid that, um, you know, we're still not sure, you know, despite information that get, gets thrown at us left and right, what the official, um, you know, vectors of transmission are, um, the the risk associated with different age groups, um, different comorbidities, all of those things. So, so that's a concern that I have, um, and I'm sure many of us do. Uh, another concern, um, you know, I've read an article about um, the, the impact of transmission through um, air circulation and, and more specifically lack thereof. 
and you know some of our, our our classrooms and the structures of our school don't really necessarily lend themselves all that well to um, efficient uh, air circulation. Some of our buildings don't even have opening windows um, because of allergies and things like that. They rely on closed uh, HVAC systems, so that's a concern. Um, and then. <laughs> To, you know, in, in terms of concerns for face-to-face -face instruction, for me, you know, when I read the CDC recommendations, um, while I'm sure they were grounded in some uh, health reality, healthcare reality, they're not grounded in academic reality in any way, shape, or form. Um, when I think of, uh, you know, what the the experience that you know, that kids have at the elementary school, which is honestly probably yeah, you know, I would imagine the the biggest concern when it comes to transmission from um, um, student to student, um, our youngest kids touch everything. Um, you know, wearing masks is not an option for for many of them. And even if they did, you know, how long until it's off and twirling on their finger? You know, they 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 touch everything, they share everything, um, and and so, <clears throat> and then you have the recommendations about busing and about you know, cohorts staying together and one adult staying with groups of kids and we can't have assemblies, recommend not having volunteers come into class or into the schools. Um, cafeteria, that's out, gotta eat lunch in your classrooms. Um, you can have recess, boys and girls, but you can't go on the, on the, on the playground equipment. Um, I, I just don't see a scenario in face-to-face -face instruction where both healthcare and healthcare best, best practices and learning best practices can coexist at the same time. Um, that's a huge challenge for me. Um, but then I have, I have concerns with virtual instruction as well um, on the other side. And, and, I, and I hear a lot of the concerns that a lot of folks are sharing right now, and I share all of them as well, both you know, as, a, as a father of, of two fifth grade students who lost their, their ability to have any sort of meaningful closure this year, um, who are going off to a new school next year. I understand that a lot of what took place in terms of instruction or virtual instruction this year, especially at the beginning, was meant to, um, you know, it was, was focused on social and emotional well-being. And, um, you know, keeping skills secure and, and trying to prevent regression as much as possible. There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, true focus, especially at the elementary level, on making substantial growth uh, that we would expect in a face-to-face -face environment. So that wasn't there. Um, and I think we all would agree that come fall, um, doesn't matter where, whether we're talking about East Penn or any, any school in, in, in the entire country, whatever we had in place in the spring is not going to be enough um, to carry that forward into the fall. It has to, be, has to be more challenging, has to be more robust, it has to be more measurable, it has to be, you know, um, you know, be able to see that we're making progress with kids if, if we were gonna be, do, be doing that. And I think we all agree on that. Um, but as a, as, a, as a father watching uh, my kids who are pretty well, you know, they're pretty independent, um, they're strong learners and they love their teachers and they love learning. Um, even watching that and, and being a part of that um, was incredibly difficult. Um, and in the beginning of all of this, back in, in March and beginning of April, you know, because of some medical, medical concerns I had in my family, I was doing it essentially as a single father. And that gave me a glimpse into some of the challenges that some of our families have um, who are single parent families, who have kids who may have uh, special learning needs, who, um, you know, there, there's all these other layers of challenges that many of us can't even really, um, can only hope to get a feel for, that some of our parents are, are, are doing the best that they can, balancing jobs, um, balancing multiple age levels, multiple grade levels, trying to get a feel for uh, is, is Johnny on track, is Susie on track, I have no, no idea what the heck Jack's supposed to do tomorrow, let's do tomorrow, and balancing all of those things, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, again, something I think that, that we, all, we all know. Um, and then the last piece that I wanted to share um, 
in terms of looking to the fall and my concerns about virtual instruction. And this is the one that I'm not sure I have seen talked about at any level, um, both in the, in the public sphere or social media sphere or, or anything like that. And, and it, 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 it's about relationship building. And when I take a look at, you know, the success or, or challenges to success of, of a plan like this, it stands a better chance of succeeding when you already have those relationships in place. So switching, um, after, you know, switching in the middle of March after having all of that period of time since September to build those relationships, that was established. So now you're moving kids online. It's not quite as awkward as maybe it would be if we're starting the year uh, in front of a computer and, and that relation, those relationships aren't built yet. The first several weeks of a school year is, is meant to be community building. And because learning can't take place, as we all know, unless kids are, are feeling safe and loved and cared for, and that there's somebody that um, you know, cares about their learning and also about them as an individual. And that becomes unimaginably more difficult when we are um, asking our teachers to build those relationships without being in a face-to-face -face environment. So, you know, that, that's, it's a, it's a challenging, it's a challenging problem. Um, you know, I have a lot of concerns at both ends and I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I certainly commend you for putting together a plan that I think takes into account all of that. Um, right now, like I said at the beginning, um, I'm just glad we've got some time to think about it because we're going to need um, quite a bit of it, I think. Thank you. Dr. Levinson. Hey, thank you, Dr. Bacher. I guess I'd first just like to say that uh, Mr. Smith, I think, just shared a myriad number of observations and concerns that, that certainly crossed my mind and of the families that uh, you know, have reached out and communicated uh, to me in the, in the in the last week or so, um, so uh, I, I'm not going to to add too much more to those points. Would, would maybe try and touch on at least a couple um, logistical questions or or, 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 or details that that uh, uh, that um, we'll probably have to go along with any of the planning. Um, you know, I guess uh, you know first I, I'd like to to say that you know I, I think something that, that, that's hard to accept as, as, as a parent of a child in a district. And I, so I can certainly relate to everybody else is that, you know, whatever plan we, we execute, you know, is, is something that's going to uh, you have to be informed by regulations and conditions that, that are at the time of the opening in August. And I think it's very difficult to live, live with uncertainty and not knowing exactly what we're gonna be doing in the fall. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, you know, it's going to take a lot of, uh, you know, patience and understanding, I think, from the community to, uh, um, you know, work with what, what the district is trying to do and, and, and maximize the, the positive as much as possible or as much as we can, the positive outcomes of, of, of the hand that we're dealt. Um, and what, you know, what I am hoping is, you know, if we are forced into doing some kind of hybrid or online um, plan at the beginning of the school year, you know, I, I would just like to, to, to keep in mind that, you know, I, I, I view that as temporary. You know, it's not something that's going to go on for forever. Uh, so, you know, when, when we do evaluate what it is we have to do when we have all the details come mid-August, mid to late August is understand that, you know, that this, this is not going to be the ongoing condition forever and we're obviously going to do the best that we can. So that, that's what I wanted just to say on that, but then just to touch on a couple of other points, you know, I do think that in addition to, to parent and community input, I think, you know, Mr. Smith's point of, of, of getting the, the general staff involved with the district and in their impression is obviously they have to work, you know, work with, you know, the students and work under those conditions. So, you know, with, with what Mrs. Campbell uh, articulated in terms of how it's going to go about, I, I do hope that that's given, you know, you know uh, just attention. Um, and then one, one, I guess, somewhat minor point is when we do consider the, the implementing the hybrid model, um, 
you know, what was outlined, you know, I think was you know, done well from a systematic standpoint and trying to look at how we're, how we're going to divide the alphabet and whatnot. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, highly contingent on, on, on needing a five day week. Um, so, I mean, have we thought about uh, our calendar changes going to be needed? If we need, if we implement the the model, so that you know we can get that balance, particularly in the high school, we only have one physical day for for each for each student cohort at the school. Are we going to have to you know take away some of these holidays or or, or half days or Act ninety, I forget the Act ninety three days or whatever they're called, um, uh, for, for for training. We've not yet considered any changes to the district calendar um, but certainly one piece that I will say that we've we've begun to look at is um, as an administrative team we recognize that there are some weeks in which potentially there might be a holiday or an off day that falls typically on a Monday um, so we have looked at is it possible to be flexible during those weeks in terms of when students are coming but again also trying to sort of balance that with trying to maintain some degree of regularity in a family schedule as to in terms of when their kids are coming to school. Okay. All right, thank you. Again, uh, you know, as Mr. Smith said, this is you know, a very complex and difficult problem. And I am also grateful that we're going to have some time to really pour over this information and, and uh, you know, come up and approve a recommendation to move forward. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Munson. Yes, thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I, I don't laugh because it's funny, but I, 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 I shake my head in thanks that I am not in your position, um, Ms. Whitman, uh, Mr. Povolitis, and um, Mrs. Campbell. I, I think you face an enormous challenge. It, it's probably a challenge that no one in public education has had to face now. Um, certainly in our lifetimes. And you, you, you face the unique and distasteful um, position of, you know, normally leadership involves knowing that um, no matter what decision you make, there's going to be a group of people who are unhappy. I think you're in a position, I guess we're in a board as, are in a position, but you in particular are in a position where no matter what decisions you ultimately decide on, everyone is going to be unhappy, uh, right? Like there's no there are no good options. Um, and so we are choosing between the least bad options. And so I just want to say that, first of all, that I appreciate the efforts that you're putting in to do the best job possible when ultimately none of these options are going to be um, very palatable uh, to anyone. Um, with, with that said, um, I actually have a couple of, of kind of specific questions. Um, one is it, I, I, and this is more of a of a question um, for the public in general. It is not clear to me, given the kinds of communications and discussions that I've had with people, um, that the community understands the constraints that you're working with. And I wondered if you could just briefly describe some of the main contours of what PDE released in terms of um, what you need to do. Uh, in order to legally open school in the fall, given the, 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 the current guidelines? Sure, I'll start off and then certainly invite my colleagues to, to join in. Um, first of all, given the current um, phase in which we are in, in our county as well as Pennsylvania, there are guidelines in terms of um, with regard to social distancing and also the size of uh, the, the amount of students who can be in a gathering in a, in a common place. So that impacts not only the numbers of students that we have in classrooms, there are recommendations for social distancing in classrooms. Um, so as you can appreciate, we in essence had to look at the total number of students in a classroom literally get as specific as looking at approximate square footage in classrooms, doing some staging to see what is feasible in terms of the numbers of students that we could safely have in a classroom with current guidelines. Um, certainly we've had to give some of those similar considerations to transportation as well. 
I will say that with regard to transportation, the, the guidelines from PDE use language regarding um, social distancing on a bus when to the greatest extent possible or feasible. Um, you know, a six foot social distancing obviously is not possible on a school bus, but we have looked at scenarios in which we potentially have maybe one student to a seat. Um, when we look at some of those large group areas, um, of course, at, at all levels, then we have to be mindful about activities such as lunch. Um, we have to be thoughtful about students being in hallways and trying to minimize the number of students who are potentially in an area at a given time at that point. So when you think about a secondary level of students switching classrooms, um, again, there's considerations for that. Laura and Doug, I know there are probably many, many things that I missed, so please feel free to add as well. I mean, basically we have other recommendations regarding what students are allowed or should not be sharing um, in the classrooms in terms of materials and resources. We're very fortunate that we went down the path that we did with the timing that we did with the one-to-one. -one. Um, and then we had, again, some greater considerations about what we're going to do in, in for instance, our um, health, well, fitness classes um, and how we're gonna handle some of those different classes where the activity may require some adjustments. So there's some curricular implications if current guidelines hold. Having areas and buildings where students who may potentially demonstrate symptoms while being in school could be safely contained and, and in essence isolated from the rest of the building, um, as well as just regular health protocols in our, our nurse's office in terms of, um, again, when students are demonstrating symptoms. And we've created a document that we shared with the board that we intend to post on our public site that again shows all the considerations from all of the different departments in the central office. So that would include public health, that would include um, human resources, transportation, food service, um, that we will be able to share. And um, we are soliciting feedback from teacher leaders at this point, but as uh, Mrs. Campbell had spoken earlier, we have not done the staff-wide survey yet. We started to craft one last week and we need to finish that work shortly. Thank you. Um, so another big question I have um, as I look at um, the, the hybrid proposal, how, how is a teacher going to simultaneously have students every day and be managing online instruction uh, that's going on at the same time? Uh, I'll speak first for the elementary level. Um, yeah, it's like you said, it's this is we're trying to do the impossible here. But um, at the elementary level each day, um, we're talking about the possibility of having like uh, meetings where kids are vir at home virtually and the other half are in the classroom just to check in. Of course, then those that are in the virtual world will be working independently on activities and then questions would be answered at the end of the day with the early dismissal time so the teachers could interact. Um, and touch base with students as needed on a regular basis. Um, uh, when students come in to the face-to-face -face time, of course, uh, we have to use that time wisely and almost sometimes flip how that classroom is typically, um, how we typically use it. But it's, it's difficult. You're not simultaneously doing both, but you're, what you're able to do is provide activities um, and lessons and work for students to be doing when they're at home. And then when they come in class that we utilize and make, make sure we emphasize um, that in-class time to make sure we're, we're moving students forward instructionally. At the secondary level, um, as we had detailed, there is, it's, it's tricky at the high school because we're, you have um, one day a week of which to have face time with your students. And the intention is to use that block period to do some of the hands-on things or the lab work that's really difficult to replicate in the remote environment. Um, but what we're looking at in terms of that Wednesday where students are not reporting, and it's an opportunity for departments to collaborate. And some of the remote learning, the direct instruction that would be delivered um, to students when they are not in school would be collaborated on. So the teachers will be working together in most instances to develop those materials and those resources and to be planning ahead um, in collaboration with one another. 
So one question, which at first I was thinking is just a sort of minor one, but I, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think it, it goes to the sort of fundamental um, nature of the experience in person, you know, under social distancing guidelines, um, which has to do with food and lunch, which, which you had mentioned in your, your presentation. Um, it, 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 I'm, I'm, well, first of the concern, the concern is that we're going to ask kids to be trying to learn um, over a period of time that is too long um, between food. Um, and uh, I, my, you know, I think Mr. Povolaitis said that the plan is to have snacks, um, which that sounds uh, good, but what, what are the conditions in which snacks can safely be given, but a lunch could not be safely uh, given? M maybe not any lunch, but some kind of lunch. Like how does, how does calling it a snack help in, in this sort of, in terms of issues of safety? Yeah, so if a student brings their own snack and they're eating in the classroom in the area where um, they're seated um, or a snack's provided by the teacher and they're sitting and they don't have to, you know, get up and move at that particular area at that particular time, um, you know, we felt like that was a, a safer way. If you have to provide lunch, oftentimes there's these, a lot of kids will buy lunch or handing out lunches. Some people can't bring lunches. And so now you have to figure out a, a much bigger managerial task. Um, um, but again, not at, there, at this point, there's nothing off the table. Um, that's why we're looking for some feedback, but we felt like, um, providing the lunches in a boxed lunch where you're quick, you, they are able to take it, get on the bus and go. And then the snacks, um, at their seat, like a working snack, it's just, um, it's, it's creates less of a mess, if you will. Um, elementary kids, when they eat lunch, someone needs to help open the milk. Mm -hmm. um, things are yeah. spilling and sure that can happen with snacks as well. There's no question about that. Um, but we felt it was a little bit less, um, of a managerial issue with snacks than it is at lunch. We have snack time, um, during the school, uh, school day now, and I can tell you lunchtime and snack time look very different in an elementary building. Um, <laughs> snack time is, does not cause as much of a mess. It does not cause as much of an issue as far as, uh, custodial support, um, and of course, the safety is the primary function here. And mm -hmm. so um, we, we are keeping kids safe following the guidelines we just discussed um, by not having them get up, move to a cafeteria, figuring out a common space, how to get lunches, um, how to pick them up, how to take them wherever they're going to take them, um, how to get lunches to a classroom. Um, so it, it's just that both of them, uh, they're a little bit different in far as, as far as managerial um, time. And then you had mentioned flexibility in, in your presentation you as one of the you know you want to you want to continue to allow my understanding was that we have to have flexibility for changing conditions so the district needs to be flexible the plans need to be flexible but that you also wanted plans that were flexible um, to meet the the needs of individual students and families and um, I, I I'm not actually trying to pin you down but I, I'm interested could you please share with us um, some of those flexibilities. Um, on, on the one hand, for example, for in-person instruction, how you plan to remain flexible for immunocompromised students uh, or uh, high-risk teachers and staff. And then on the other end, on the, the sort of remote learning, um, what flexibility would look like um, in terms of families that struggle with daycare um, um, and uh, particularly timing. I mean, some of what I've heard today sounds like you're, you're planning on a lot more synchronous remote uh, learning. Um, and, you know, that, that introduces challenges in, in, the, in the daily schedule of families. So where are, what are some of the options for building flexibility into these models, both for in-person um, teaching and remote teaching? Doug, do you want me to go first? So I can talk about medically compromised. So for instance, if we return, let's pretend that we're in green and we can return in traditional format, but we still have um, immunocompromised students. Those students would be available to learn with us remotely is one of the contingency plans that we are trying to put into place for next year. Um, again, in remote learning, we're doing what we can to support families in the remote learning setting, setting in terms of um, tech support, offering them access to our uh, instructional technology coaches to actually talk with them. Um, and they have like an office hours that's available not only to work with our teachers, but to also work with families. And that was the development during the continuity of learning plan. 
Um, in terms of childcare, we don't have any answers in place at this point. And, and again, there are different things that are emerging from the state in terms of guidance, but we have nothing concrete um, in, in, a, in our district's ability to do something and address that, that specific concern. I think our best efforts were put into place with what we tried to do with the hybrid, which was again, um, have siblings, older siblings potentially home with younger students. Um, and we recognize that a lot of our older students would actually be, um, especially at the high school level, home or available, you know, multiple days a week and only in school one day a week. Um, and so that may pose some uh, better logistics for families than if we had constructed this a different way. Mm -hmm. At the elementary level, um, as I spoke to before, you know, I, it wouldn't be all synchronous. I think I gave an example or two of that, but um, maybe a class meeting, but then there would also be recorded lessons. Um, things like math, they would do their kind of exploring and developing things in school. When they head home, there'd be a lot of practice um, that they'd be working on. Um, for um, a lot of the reading instruction, there'd be certain lessons that would happen when they're in school and then lessons that um, work um, better um, at home or remote setting um, could be done in, in that way or not necessarily better, but um, uh, that could be accommodated best in that setting. Um, so you're just going to, you know, flip that. And so we also have to prepare that if, you know, um, we go to a remote setting because of something happening or an increase in cases and the state requires us to do that, we're planning for that to be able to flip into that and that flexibility where if we need to do that, we'd be more prepared than we were um, in March um, to, to do that. And so that just gives you, that's a few examples, but for each subject area, um, our teacher leaders and our um, curriculum office has been working on on plans for this. And what about teachers and staff in, in the case in which we are um, in person, um, you know, with social um, distancing and so forth, if we're in the hybrid model, what about teachers and staff um, who are at risk? Yeah, we've discussed this and, um, you know, uh, they would have to um, provide a doctor's note of, of what's, you know, um, the reason in, in which they could not come to work. Um, and that, of course, would go through the human resource office and would be taken on a case by case basis. And then, um, you know, we'd put into place accommodations and modifications if needed, or um, make sure we work with them on an individualized plan. Great. So, I, I mean, I know you're looking for, uh, thank you for your answers to those questions. I mean, I know you're looking for feedback. I don't really have any because, uh, you know, the, 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 the problems are so big and, and there's so many unknowns, um, except a, a general one, which is that, you know, so many of the decisions uh, that, that come before the board are, are primarily educational decisions. And we, because we are not educational professionals, um, we rightly um, depend on the, the quality and expertise of, of the recommendations that you make as an administration uh, for the district. Um, I actually think this issue is a little bit different um, because fundamentally the problem that we all face is not an educational one. Um, it is this sort of the sort of confluence of forces that obviously implicates and impacts education, but it has all of these other pieces as well. And so, you know, my own feeling is that the as the representatives of the of the community, um, it's important for the board to be perhaps more involved in the evolving discussions about this issue than would normally be appropriate in many of the issues um, that come before the board. So I, I hope you'll take that into account. Um, my only other suggestion is uh, to think uh, as absolutely broadly um, as possible. You know, I, I, I appreciated Dr. Levinson bringing up the issue of calendar changes. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know uh, what legal requirements we have about uh, how we space our days out. Um, maybe we need to look uh, to uh, you know a, a more staggered model. Um, you know whether or not we should be looking at Monday through Friday versus other days. Whether we should be looking at year-round school. I'm not advocating any of those things. I don't know enough about it. But it's, they're just examples of ways to be thinking about this um, that are, that that go. 
outside the norm um, of public education um, because I, you know I think I the one thing I can say without any fear of contradiction is that the conversation we're having right now and the problems that we're facing and you in particular are, are, are faced uh, with making decisions about are way outside the norm for public education and so I think we need to match the creativity of our brainstorming and our thinking um, with the not just the gravity but the scope of um, of the problem that we face. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munson. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Um, thank you. And, um, you know, a, a big thank you and appreciation to, to our administration for, for the time and efforts being put into this, uh, you know, undesirable situation. Um, you know, I do have, you know, obviously, anything less than going back in person full time is, is not desired by 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 anyone. Um, being being that you know we don't know where we are going to be in in August or September. Is is there a plan to put in place you know additional training during the summer months? You know, well, obviously we don't want to put our teachers through anything more than than they already have have been doing is there a plan for more training so that you know if we are in a virtual all virtual or hybrid situation we will be better prepared and, and be in a position to better you know educate um, our students I can speak to the secondary level in the last days um, that we have our teachers at the end of the school year the work will be focused on preparing for fully remote learning in the fall and that's really because that prepares us for the worst case scenario that can still be utilized in terms of the teachers um, moving their content to Schoology and learning the nuts and bolts around Schoology and then having time to collaborate with one another before the school year starts so that's a focus at the secondary level yeah, and at the, at the elementary level, we have the same. Those June, June days, those last few days of, of teacher work, or at least time um, that they're putting in for, for professional development is will be focused on um, some instructional practices and the resources that'll be used in um, remote slash hybrid learning, so. Yeah, and, and I do, you know, appreciating that we do have, uh, you know, a more opportunity to prepare uh, you know, even for, for what, what you, you had mentioned, um, Mr. Mr. Popolitis, that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, reports out there and expectation that we will, we, we, we could very much face a, a recurrence of, of you know, a, a full on pandemic in the fall that we are, you know, better prepared uh, in, in that instance, um, you know. Also, you know, one of my, and I, you know, I echo all, all the comments my colleagues have already made. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, every comment, every, everyone is, is concerned with, you know, making sure our students and teachers are in the best position possible. Um, one of my concerns, though, is with the transition students, you know, those, you know, rising kindergartners, those going you know and entering the middle schools those entering the high school will there be any you know even over the summer months whether it be virtual or or limited groups of in-person um you know tours is there a plan you know for an introduction for these students for you know the entering into the new schools that what they may experience um, in an effort to, you know, minimize or reduce, you know, the stress and pressure that, you know, is added by transitioning to a new, a new school or environment. Yeah, I, the biggest transition at the elementary level, of course, is the transition into school and uh, for those kindergarten students. And so what we've done is put a committee together and our our, our leaders have worked on a district level communication, just giving a, a glimpse at what going to school looks like. And then, of course, kind of like a kindergarten orientation by building would be the second phase for that to introduce kids that have never been in school to come into school now is just going to be very difficult emotionally and socially so uh, we are planning for that and then at the other levels as well I can speak to that yes there are some virtual transition plans 
Um, and that's all. I, I mean, I'm not going to take up any more time. I, like I said, I echo the other comments, and I, I really do thank you and and, and for you know the, this situation and just your thoughtfulness and, and just the time and efforts that the administration is putting into you know what's been done so far um, and what you know what you know preparing for the unknown in in the fall. So 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 thank you to to all of you and, and our teachers for your your time and, and efforts. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bowman. So, thank you. Um, I just had a string of questions about the elementary level decisions. Um, I'm, I think, I just wanted, I guess, to make sure that I, I understand this one thing correctly. The early dismissal on the elementary level is because we're trying not to have them eat lunch in the building, or is it for a different reason? At the elementary level, the, the, it's a, a several different reasons. And no, it did not start with lunch. Uh, the main reason really was that as elementary leaders, we felt it was best to have students in face to face as much as possible and as safe as possible. So having them in two days in a row and then rotating that Wednesday, the two days in a row we felt was safe because the you know they're at the same desk, and so we don't have to necessarily clean as much as we would if you're switching students. Um, and so the early dismissal time provides that hybrid learning time because if the teachers, somebody pointed out earlier, I think it might have been Dr. Munson, how can you live in both worlds? You can. So dismissing early, although that's not a very, you know, it's, no one loves it, um, but dismissing early allows for some of that e-learning time or that remote learning time, um, you know, for the teachers to be able to work in that world when, the, when they also had students face to face for some of the, t some of the time. And if you don't have a drop day where you're doing um, remote learning all day and, and you have students in every single day, then you have to do the early dismissal to provide some time for that. So that was the main reason. Um, lunch is very difficult with the social distancing um, practices that are currently in place now, which were mentioned several times tonight. And so lunch is a real challenge, especially at the elementary level, because I think as Mr. Smith mentioned, your elementary students have their hands everywhere and they need help and support with a lot of things. And so how do we manage that as best as we can with safety as a priority, but at the same time, you know, not having kids hungry and it's difficult, but that's kind of where we are. Okay. And then you had mentioned synchronous learning and is that the idea of that works like, um, I know you have some math classes where some kids in the elementary level are actually taking math at the middle school, but they're doing it through uh, some cameras and stuff. And is that the same idea um, that you'll be doing here where you'll have cameras set up and so kids will be actually watching that class at home? Yes, yeah, so the synchronous, I, I, just to clarify, like, you know, look, a class meeting a day possibly would be synchronous, but with the focus would still be on asynchronous learning so that people could, it's recorded, they could come, you know, if they can't be there at a certain time because of a daycare or a parent, like, mm -hmm. so, so no, it's not a synchronous focus, but we're trying to build in class meeting time where everybody could connect at a certain time um, just to go over expectations. And if that's missed, it's missed. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, and lessons as well would be recorded and more asynchronous and we'd figure out a plan to meet the needs of you know, all situations because we know it's going to be difficult. And then do we have some classes that if we're in um, the hybrid model that we're thinking we might not offer at all, for example, chorus, um, are there any others like that where some of the uh, guidance has been that there's no safe way to, for example, sing in person with groups of people? So we've looked at and um, the Office of Teaching and Learning and the building administrators have met with the leadership in music. Um, there may be an opportunity for lessons or other things to replace some of those activities. There may be means of which we can use technology to achieve some things but we acknowledge that there are gonna be some curricular adjustments and we'll be more transparent with that as we work through them with more clear guidance on, on what's gonna stick for the opening of the school year. But at this point, we're running the scheduler based on the requests that were made by students and what they wanted to have in the fall. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and then I guess the last two things are comments. Um, I understand uh, why the schedule's this way and it might be the only way to do it in a hybrid model. But one thought I had is that um, 
a lot of parents were sort of looking for the finish line of homeschooling their elementary school children. And um, given that more and more parents will be going back to work outside of their homes in the fall, I don't know if that's a tenable model to assume that um, a couple days a week, someone can help these kids learn online. Um, and I think it's a false assumption to think that those kids have older brothers, like older, older siblings. Uh, some of them do, but obviously some of them don't. Um, and it seems like the elementary kids are the ones that are most in need of in-person instruction to me. Um, obviously, you could make a case for some kids, that, uh, special ed kids needing special ed uh, in-person instruction too. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a thought of making this what would be way more complex, but also with the idea of that you would bring in person the kids who most need that learning and then offer remote to the kids who least need it. And then with remote, what the one thing that I've wondered the most is why are we all inventing the same model all through the Lehigh Valley? For example, algebra is algebra, whether you're in East Penn, Allentown, Easton, Wilkes-Barre, we could just have one person teaching that for all of those kids remotely. It doesn't, I mean, I know that takes incredible coordination between schools, but um, that would free up teaching time for um, us to spread our kids out throughout the, the school to have more kids in person. So it's just a thought. Obviously, it's a organizational nightmare to do what I'm suggesting, but um, it would allow you to bring the kids who most need that, that in-person instruction into the schools and then find a more creative solution for the other kids that might be fine with not having so much um, in person with their teachers. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Uh, Mr. Champagne? Yes, just a couple of quick things. I do appreciate all the comments my colleagues have made. I, I guess two points I'd like to, to, to make. One is, I echo Dr. Munson in, in the sense that, you know, because this is a, such a fluid situation and it is, you know, something that we have never faced before and hopefully we'll never face again, I think more information and, and you know, more reports to the board uh, every, at every meeting about where we are headed and what is changing, uh, I think are gonna be key to help the administration and the board and, and also reassure the public that this is at the forefront of our uh, thinking. I know that in the conversations that I have had with, with parents, you know, they all are anxious about how we're gonna make this decision they all want to see us, you know, go back to the quote normalcy that we had before March. And I think, you know, I think we would all love to see that happen as well. But I, I, you know, we have to recognize that that may not obviously be possible. And what you presented this evening suggests that you know, you're doing with, with what you can, at what you know at the, at the present time, you've laid out a plan. And I think that's helpful for the public now to digest and also, you know, provide feedback. But as we get that feedback, as we get it from your, 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 your team internally, from teachers, uh, I think it's really critical that the board hear that real time and, and, and be able to digest it so that we're not put in a position where we're trying to make a very difficult decision uh, in a very short period of time that we have. And, then, and my only question is, you mentioned that the CILIU is, was uh, you know, a task force for the, you know, all of Lehigh County. So I'm wondering, is this model that you have proposed something that all the, 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 the schools in the district, uh, in, within the county, uh, this is how they're planning to go forward? Or is each district, you know, kind of on its own? And, you know, if there are different models, why are they looking at something different? When we think about the three basic models, I, the ones that we've outlined tonight, um, to put it quite simply, are not necessarily rocket science. Like the, meaning there are, there is the traditional, we have all kids here. 
um, in our in our 10 buildings for face to face instruction. We then have instruction that's her happening fully online and or a hybrid some combination thereof. So I can share that in general. Um, certainly, I would say that probably most school districts across the state are all trying to be as prepared to the greatest extent possible for any one three versions of what we just described. I think where there might be some differences would be with the hybrid model in which we are attempting to divide our total student populations at each building into smaller groups that are aligned with the CDC guidelines. And so what those schedules might look like each week will vary based on district size. And probably the best example that I have is if you think of a school, a high school, such as the size of maybe Salisbury or Northwestern Lehigh, as compared to a high school the size of Emmaus, um, the, the, the frequency with which they may be able to bring their high school students in would certainly be greater than what we could at Emmaus High School, just because we have to break our students into smaller groups. Okay. But I would say, to answer your question, I think the basic premise is very similar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, I had a number of questions that were answered. I have a, just a, a couple more, one on the uh, mechanics. Uh, my understanding reading the presentation beforehand and even in the discussion is what we're voting on is not, oh, we're gonna start in this mode or this mode or this mode. We're voting on a model that if we have to be in this mode, here's what we're going to do. If we have to be in this mode, uh, here's what we're going to do. Is that correct? That we're we're voting on here's here's the three options we'll we'll allow in in school going on, and we'll make the decision of where we need to be based on what's happening at the time. If I can interject, you're actually going to be voting on and approving a health and um, safety plan for the reopening of schools. Yeah. Does that tangentially kind of result in whether or not you're going to allow for the reopening of schools? Absolutely. But you're actually going to be asked to approve the health and safety plan. And so that is, if, if we're in green or yellow, here's the steps we will take to meet the guidelines, the required guidelines. Yeah, um, think of it, uh, I, I think everybody would be well served by, after this meeting sometime, going on to the PDE website. Keep in mind, they've issued nothing other than, I'm quoting, preliminary guidance, close quote. Um, and it gives a sense of what, uh, if you're in the yellow or green zone, uh, you must have in this plan. They've also, it's very clear that they're going to be giving more guidance within the next couple of weeks. But ultimately, you're approving the health and safety plan. And then when we're actually open the schools, hopefully some, sometime before, we'll ma be making a decision of where, where we're, we're in this, we're in green level or we're in yellow level. So here's what part of the plan we're executing on. Is that correct? Correct. You're, it, you have to be in the yellow or green yep. zone. Correct. Okay. And I, I uh, appreciate um, the uh, changes uh, you discussed um, with regard to our current continuity, continuity of learning uh, plan. I do have a question. Um, Mr. Provolitis brought it up several times, the sort of flipped classroom idea. I've heard that before where perhaps lectures would be given as homework and then students would do what would traditionally be considered homework in the class period where they have the, the instructor there to answer questions and seek guidance. Uh, it seems like that would be um, uh, very well suited to the hybrid learning approach, um, but I don't know other than uh, a couple examples, are we sort of fleshing that out more broadly or there's just a couple examples where we're that's an explanation of how like the online learning topics would look and the in in class instruction would look are, are 
are we ta talking about doing that more broadly or just these are specific examples that look like an inverted classroom? Uh, from subject to subject at the elementary level, it differs slightly. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, um, that's what it would look like. Um, we're trying to figure out the best way, knowing if kids are in a hybrid model, what's the best way to provide instruction when they're in face to face? And then what's the best that can be done when they're independent and they're at home, knowing the circumstances that have been brought up. So yes, we're looking at various models of ensuring that we use the time most effectively and efficiently, but also um, have high expectations for instruction and a flexibility knowing people are in difficult situations. Yeah, and at the secondary level, um, very similar. So asynchronous learning would be that direct instruction or that flipped learning, and we would make the most out of the in-person learning time that we have in the hybrid model. Um, and then one other thing, just to add, I think the important thing to differentiate between the continuity of learning plan that we prepared for the spring, the thing that we would be submitting to the state is a flexible instruction day um, plan and we would be seeking the state approval of that plan. And that would be, um, if you recall, a long time ago, they came out with that for snow days, and that's now the language that they're applying to what the instructional model would look like in the situation as we prepare for the fall. Okay, thank you. Um, it doesn't look like there are any, I think the hands up are, are for questions already asked, is that correct? Yeah, okay, so moving on. Uh, 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 Dr. Bacher, could I, I guess, raise a parliamentary question? Um, so we've we've been um, doing this almost continuously for three and a half hours. W would you entertain a uh, a five minute um, stretch and bathroom break at this point? Can I have a show of hands of how many directors would like that? Or uh, I think I'm seeing a majority. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I would move that we recess for five. I, I, I move that we uh, recess for five minutes. Okay. Is there a second? Was second. that Naomi? Naomi will second it. Okay. Um, can we just have a hand vote for all those in favor? I see at least five. So why don't we have a five-minute adjournment, and I'll. Uh, we'll uh, meet back at t uh, five of 11.
I see that some of you also got snacks. <laughs> Not only elementary school kids need their snacks. Um, for uh, clarity, I think I'll, uh, it looks like all the directors are back. Uh, perhaps we should call roll, Mr. Fisher, so we can assure that everyone can see and, see and uh, be heard what's happening. Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Attendance. Mr. Champagne. Here. Mr. Jankowski. Here. Dr. Levinson. Here. Dr. Munson. Uh, present with snacks now. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Here, also with snacks. <laughs> Ms. Winch. Here. Ms. Bowman. Here, without snacks. Mr. Bird. Here. Dr. Bacher. Here. All present. Uh, so moving forward to our next uh, and last presentation, uh, final budget update. Mrs. Campbell. Save the best for last. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Uh-oh. I think my computer got a little tired, that's all. All right, we'll go this way. Okay, um, moving on to our final budget presentation, then to be followed by um, a vote of the board on the final budget. And I wanna just start off very briefly by sharing that I think we all share the sentiment that this has certainly been an interesting budget season for all of us. And the unexpected and sudden change in our local economy connected to COVID-19 certainly had a significant impact on our anticipated revenues. Fortunately, we did get some good news from the state recently in terms of the state budget has maintained level funding for, for education and we will see that later as part of um, the budget summary. The final budget that we evening to the board as well as to the community represents one of, of great compromise on behalf of our entire organization. Every building, every department, most labor groups helped to fill the $6 million deficit that we faced only a few weeks ago. And throughout the entire budget process, we truly have always maintained our focus on providing high quality programs that meet the academic, social, and emotional needs of our students in East Penn. And, and we feel very good about the budget that we're bringing forward in terms of its ability to continue to sustain those programs, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. I wanted to start off by providing the board with just a brief update in terms of the adjustments that have been made to this final budget since our last meeting on May 27th. And so, these adjustments, again, are a very high level overview of those changes that have been made in the past two weeks. Um, one of which is the building and department budgets, which include an average of a 10% reduction, um, total savings you can see of about $800,000. The other piece is the, in terms of wage concessions, we were incredibly fortunate to have most of our labor groups um, agree to a salary or a wage freeze for the upcoming school year. In particular, at the last meeting, we talked about the agreement that we had with EPEA, which is our professional staff. I also shared at our May 27th meeting that we had agreement for a wage uh, for salary freeze from Act 93, which is our administrative team. And I'm also um, happy to report to the board tonight that we also have agreement for wage freeze with the Teamsters, which represents our custodians and maintenance. And you, so you can see there the overall savings or reduction, I should say, within the budget is slightly higher than what we had anticipated at the May meeting. And that is a result of um, some additional groups accepting that freeze. 
You can see as well, we have several staffing reductions that we have um, included as part of the budget. And I won't go through all of these reductions. They would have been reductions that were shared with the board and with the community at one of our, our three budget presentations. But the piece that I do want to point out is that based on feedback from the board, we have maintained one elementary teaching position. Originally, we were proposing reducing three elementary positions and we have, um, based on your feedback, we have maintained one of those positions in the budget. In particular, that's at Albertus Elementary. And when we look at our large class sizes there, as well as the fact that that is the school in which that sits in ascending area in which there's some new development or new growth, um, we certainly thought it would be to um, the appropriate response to keep that teacher there. The other position that we maintained in the budget is an English as a second language teacher. That is a teacher who specifically provides support to our ELL students. Um, and so certainly we, we are appreciative of the fact that we're able to maintain that position in the budget. When we look at other adjustments that we've made, You'll see here that these all mirror previous adjustments that had been proposed in previous meetings, including um, reductions in private parochial charter school runs, which is a transportation savings, a savings to our copy or service contract. Um, you'll see there the reduction in capital reserve contribution has remained the same as well as fund balance. We'll talk in a moment um, as well about the debt restructuring, and then you'll see their reductions to conferences and substitute teaching positions as a result of teachers going to conferences. Um, there's been a reduction there as well. The one piece, the other piece that I wanted to draw the board's attention to is, again, based on feedback from the board, we have maintained all of our clubs and activities at the middle and high school level. You might recall in particular that was proposed as part of our most recent phase as a potential reduction um, and certainly appreciate the fact that the board sees, as we do, great value in those clubs and activities. And so we were able to maintain them in the budget. Um, what this equates to, and Mr. Saul is going to go over um, the budget summary in a bit more detail, but this does then create a balanced budget with a property tax increase of 1.2%. Okay, I guess I'm up. Um, if I could just take a few minutes to talk through um, this summary, which is a, a page from the long range fiscal plan. Um, if we look first at column H, this is essentially the evaluation and close out of the current year. Um, and as we evaluated the current year, um, which by the way was, is still relatively difficult with only a year remaining, um, just the way that our revenues flow in. Um, so we, we've certainly given it our, our best shot. Um, but if we, look at the, if we look at the current year, when we evaluated it, the, we, the ending balance came out to be a positive uh, variance of $649,800. And so we're recommending movement of $600,000 in the current year to the Capital Reserve Fund, which then brings the balance, and you can see this uh, at the end of the year to uh, in cell H30, um, you can see it would bring it to $49,800. The reason for the recommended uh, movement to the Capital Reserve Fund is uh, having the knowledge that the next few budget cycles may be challenging and um, contributions to the, to the Capital Reserve Fund could potentially be curtailed. In addition, we had also curtailed the contribution for next year. So that's, that's funds that are left uh, over, if you will, or otherwise would go to fund balance at the end of the year we're recommending. Uh, this evening, uh, listed on the bill list on page five, is that uh, contribution to capital reserve in the amount of $600,000. If we move on to the next column, column I, uh, that is the budget for next year. And if I can just talk about a few items as we work down through this. First, 
um, when we look at the revenues, as uh, Mrs. Campbell had indicated on May 29th, Governor Wolf uh, signed the 2020-21 uh, state budget into law. And while most of the, the, the departments and operations of the state um, were under a five month budget at the state level, education was actually uh, funded for 12 months, uh, which is positive for education because we um, know that, that the um, uh, state funding that, that's been allocated will be for the full year. Um, included in that was assurance that the CARES Act fund, uh, monies that we had talked about previously will not be carved out of our basic education funding as uh, we talked about had happened uh, with the ERA funds in, in 2010 timeframe. Um, so that was good assurance because we now know that those funds are not, they, those are gonna be above and beyond um, the, the monies we're receiving from the state. In addition, uh, the state funded a school health and safety grant, um, which will be distributed through the uh, Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, PCCD, and East Penn is slated to receive $695,000. Um, given the certainty that we now have regarding the budget, it's been enacted, uh, we felt it only prudent to include these two pieces of funding in the budget for next year. Um, now, it's important to note that both of these have limited or restricted uses that are specifically related to um, addressing expenses and recovery from uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we couldn't necessarily have used those for our general operational expenses in the budget. Um, in turn, so we've included them as revenues. On the expenditure side, we have included an equal uh, expenditure in a generic account that would then account for the expenditures. And while we haven't come up with a specific plan on how to spend those at this point, um, we certainly uh, feel that as we develop our operational plan for the fall and identify other uh, conting contingency costs for the uh, fall, those costs related to COVID-19 will, will be allocated or will, will use those funds that have been set aside for those purposes. Um, if we look at cell I-20, we can see there where the capital reserve fund had, has been reduced by $500,000 as we discussed. If you look at cell I-21, uh, you can see the effect of the debt structure, re, uh, uh, sorry, the debt service restructuring, which we've talked about. So you can see that in the summary. And then finally, if we look at cell I-31, we can see the $500,000, half a million dollar structural deficit, which we said we were gonna use a half a million dollars from fund balance. Um, so really, in this summary, you can see many of the things that we've discussed uh, for next year. And then finally, in columns uh, J through M, if you look specifically at row 20 and 21, um, these two are, um, the capital reserve fund transfer and debt service uh, transfer. As we've talked about many times, each time you see a reduction in the debt service amount, you'll see an increase in the amount going to a uh, capital reserve fund. And again, um, that's an area uh, that will help us fund our ongoing um, capital projects and, and maintenance um, program, uh, but certainly an area that we may be able to find relief because of the way we've uh, structured this in the future. I think the final, uh, area, final row we want to look at is row 30. Um, and you can see in row 30, um, a slightly increasing structural deficit over the next several years. Um, primarily, I would say related to the um, estimated decrease in the Act 1 index. Uh, as we go out, we, we've talked about the fact that we could uh, see a decline in the Act 1 index. Um, which obviously affects our revenues. And so that would be what's primarily driving that uh, structural deficit. Again, I would just remind the board and the community that this is, uh, you know, if, as you look at the years into the future, it's certainly a, a projection based on our best estimate, um, but that certainly can change as we move into the future. Um, I think we're ready then to move on to the next slide which is just, again, a recap of the property tax rebate program, uh, which we discussed at the last board meeting. Uh, this represents uh, what, we, what was agreed upon, I think, at the end of the last meeting, again, where we would move that percentage factor. Um, we would increase the maximum household income from 20,000 to 22,000, 
we would align the uh, income ranges with the, the Commonwealth of uh, Pennsylvania's property tax and rent rebate program, with the exception of that area where a person would receive a lower refund, specifically the $8,000 to $10,000 range. And we will continue to look at this in the future. And we uh, heard several comments and certainly support over time increasing this to match the um, Commonwealth program. And if we go to the final slide, you can just see visually in a chart what the income eligibility guidelines uh, would look like based on um, the final proposal. So are there any questions from the board? Mr. Champagne? Yes, thank you. Um, not so much questions. I guess I, I, I guess I have a couple of concerns and just want to kind of air my thoughts on the the budget. First of all, I'd like to thank you know Mr. Saul and and, and Mrs. Campbell and all of the, the administrators for doing a very heroic job in pulling this together. It's been a, I know a very challenging effort on on the behalf of all of the parties involved. And you know I really want to thank the East Penn. Uh, team uh, and our, you know, all of our teachers and, and other employees for the sacrifices that they're willing to make in terms of wage concessions this year. It's been a great, uh, you know, help to, to the budget. But I guess fundamentally, I still have a problem with the fact that we're, you know, in a situation where the unemployment numbers are still extremely high, double digits. Um, many people don't have a job. Those that may have a job may not have the same level of income that they once did. And we're still asking the general public to have additional taxes put on their back. And I know that we're trying to balance the needs of the district, not only this year, but for years in the future and recognizing that the years in the future may be equally as challenging, but we don't know until obviously we see how the economy rebounds or, or doesn't. I struggle with, you know, I've struggled with this all weekend, whether I can support this budget with this tax increase. And I guess I'm coming down to the point where I think there are still some things that we can do, especially in the area of the finance uh, restructuring that we can either eliminate or very substantially reduce the tax increase for this coming year and still not put the district at jeopardy. So I am probably not going to be able to support this budget at this point because uh, I think we need to really step back and not only look at what we're asking our teachers to sacrifice and our other employees to sacrifice, but the sacrifice that the, 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 the total community is having to make, um, you know, just to keep their heads above water in many cases. Um, so while I believe that the administration has done a terrific job in pulling this together under difficult circumstances and has taken, you know, feedback from the board and into account, I just don't think we have, you know, done enough in this, in this sort of the circumstances to warrant a tax increase at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Munson? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because it's late, but I would echo what uh, Mr. Champagne uh, said. I, I believe every discussion of the budget we've had this year um, since the um, pandemic hit, I've asked um, what a 0% tax increase would look like this year. Um, I, I feel like I have actually, as I do every year, learned a lot from Mr. Saul and the conversations we've had. Um, and it, under normal circumstances, this is, um, this is a budget that I could support. Um, but given that we are living in such unusual times and the community is hurting in a way uh, we always have people in our community hurting, but the uh, the, the scale and, and the depth of it is um, at historical proportions right now. And so um, I, I think we need to be, while I understand the, the 
fiscal responsibility to the to the future years. I think right now our district is in a good enough position that we can help uh, that the proper balance is um, is to um, is to use some of that cushion that we have built through conservative fiscal management now uh, to avoid a, a tax increase. Are there other uh, comments from the board? Um, well, I'd like to say I have a differing, uh, somewhat different viewpoint from uh, Dr. Munson and, and uh, Mr. Champagne. Uh, I recall um, last year um, in budget time, we were uh, close to a balanced budget and I think there was push by um, by the board to to stretch and reach, I'm sorry, reach a zero tax increase last year. And um, I was recalling at the beginning of this year, uh, we started in a hole. Um, we started at 3% tax increase um, without any of the district priorities included at all. And um, I, for one, uh, remembering back on what the priorities are, um, I know even earlier this meeting, we talked, uh, several, several board members talked about, you know, applying resources to the elementary schools to improve um, where we have problems in the district. And the number one priority for the district was elementary reading, source, reading resources. It's a program that we've seen benefits from. We got, you know, teachers and a lot of, um, laudatory comments that it works, that it's something we wanted to expand. And I was really hoping at the start of this budget cycle that we would find a way not only to lower the tax increase from the 3% where it started, but also to include at least those resources in the budget. And um, while I understand why we're not including, while we're not including expansion, uh, my viewpoint is that we are cutting significantly. Um, as I've mentioned before, going through uh, some of the budgets earlier in uh, this year, I recall having a zero, uh, um, uh, perhaps getting a little behind and having to raise uh, taxes above the Act One index, um, which is a very, very difficult thing for a board member uh, to do, I believe. It was very difficult for me, but it was necessary because of the dire circumstances. Um, I would agree with Dr. Munson that we're not in those circumstances now, but I think there's always going to be a reason. And yes, we could use more fund balance to, to get a balanced budget, but I do not think that would be a prudent I'm sorry, not a balanced budget, a zero tax increase. I don't think that would be a prudent use of funds, um, especially since if past history is any guidance, the Act One index will be lower in, in the next few years and it will be uh, more difficult to recover um, if we get so uh, behind the curve, so to speak. So uh, I applaud the administration for doing a diligent job on the budget. Um, uh, I am concerned about using more fund balance or more debt proceeds for, um, for current day operating expenses. I do not think that's prudent. And so um, uh, while I understand this isn't a budget that I would have envisioned uh, wanting from the, at the beginning of the year, uh, I will be supporting this budget. Are there any comments, other comments from the board? Yeah, Dr. Levinson. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bucker. You know, I, I've been struggling over this over the, over the weekend um, and, and thinking about it, but, but I have to say that I'm, I'm thinking, I think I'm leaning more towards Dr. Bacher's arguments uh, that, you know, it's, it, we have to take an opportunity to do something now to help us down the road. Uh, you know, 
I am pleased that with, with some of the things that happened in the last couple of weeks, we were able to take down the one and a half percent to 1.2%. Um, so again, overall, you know, I, I do you know, applaud the efforts of the, of the administration in, in assembling you know, what is a, a very difficult budget to, to have put together. Um, so I guess to at least entertain the, the objections of, of Mr. Champagne and, 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 and Dr. Munson, I would like to hear from the administration, you know, what what is is presently, or what, what could we put on the table? I guess from 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 some of the maneuvers that have happened in the last couple of weeks, uh, that that might help to to chip that away a little bit. I mean, we, I know we talked about, and I, and you know, I certainly agree the rationale with wanting. This is for for example, I certainly agree with the rationale that, you know, we we want to to uh, um, you know, shore up our capital reserve fund, for instance, um, and uh, you know, it, you know, could some of that six hundred thousand dollars per, perhaps be shunted back to the budget and bring this down a little bit more? You know, I do know that we have. Uh, we're going to have. We're going to discuss this a little bit more uh, in relation to the uh, to the debt restructuring aspect. I know that we've we've built in scenario one to what we have right now. Um, but I, but if, if I've read things correctly, we're, we're actually you know, allowing our our, uh, our our financial advisors to some flexibility to also look for the opportunity to uh, to maybe pull some additional debt um, in, in, into the restructuring, subject to where the interest rates are at that point, um, which again may may free up some additional uh, um, you know. Funds, I guess, moving into into uh, you know, the coming year, um, and then I guess the third part is to look at, at fund balance again. But I would like to to to, to hear the administration uh, viewpoint on, on maybe tapping a little bit more to uh, you know to bring this down to just a little bit more. Um, but but again, I you know, based on Dr. Bacher's arguments, you know, I, I, there's a lot to balance here. And I think it's going to be difficult to, to uh, you know, you know, meet the needs in coming years if if if, if we do take this down to, to to zero. Sure, I'll um, I guess what I would say is I'll I'll speak to the 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 um, capital reserve transfer for the the current year, um, you know that it. it, it in terms of you using that to lower uh, the tax rate, the capital reserve that's on the, the amount that's unspent, it's being recommended for transfer to capital reserve would go to fund balance. That we've talked about fund balance in the past as like savings, it's money you have available for one time to, exp to spend one time. Um, if you lower the tax rate, you're really lowering revenues that support ongoing expenses. And so you're now taking funds that you have in a savings to support um, your recurring expenses. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Ultimately, it is the board's uh, choice. Um, but in terms of anything else, I mean, we, we've re I've really shared my thoughts over the last several meetings in terms of the uh, other various items. So I don't have anything to, to add to those comment, that commentary. Okay. Um. I appreciate that. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith? Yeah, just in the interest of time, I just had a quick question. Um, if for some reason um, the budget does not pass tonight, what um, what's the next step? If the budget doesn't pass tonight, we would need um, direction from the board um, collectively uh, what we should bring back. Because uh, obviously from, a, from an administration standpoint, we uh, put together a budget that we've, we felt, as Mrs. Campbell said, um, represent significant compromise from all uh, sides of the issue. Um, and so we would need some, some clear direction about um, what the board dislikes about the plan and, and where we needed to make change. And I'll, I, I don't want to speak for Mrs. Campbell. I certainly hope she has anything to add. No, 
I appreciate that. And I think your, um, your response as well to Mr. Levinson's question, I, I share, I, I share your, um, you know, your perspective on that as well. As you can appreciate, we've certainly had ongoing conversations um, with the board about the tax increase. And Mr. Saul and I have um, discussed that certainly on a regular basis, I would say over the past um, at least three to four months of the budget development process. And so ultimately it, it's our obligation to bring forth a recommendation that we feel um, is not only the best recommendation for obviously this particular year for which you're approving a budget, but also one, we have an obligation to sort of look on the horizon and, and put forth a plan that we feel um, provides financial stability to the district moving forward as well. And so um, I can assure you that we've been very intentional about our decisions that we bring forward to you. And so if, if the board, if there's, if there's different feedback today or, or if depending on how the vote goes, then certainly we have, um, our goal would be to bring back a budget that reflects consensus of the board. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bowman? Uh, yes, so um, it's interesting at the beginning of this process, I started where Mr. Champagne is and um, at ending the budgetary process in support of um, what we have here now. Um, the main thing that uh, where my thoughts lie is that I'm um, maybe wrongly so not as worried about people not being able to afford to pay an extra 60 or $70 as much as I'm worried about people not being able to pay their tax bill at all. And that's going to be a problem whether we uh, pass this with this 1.2% increase or not. Um, and so as, as I said at the last meeting, um, if there's any thing we can put in place to be more understanding, responsive, and gentle with the people who um, for uh, really extreme circumstances can't pay their taxes. Um, I understand we're under um, a lot of limitations from the state and maybe even federally for that, but um, that's, I'm more fearful for people in that situation than I am about this increase. Um, and I'm also understanding that um, though we didn't actually furlough anybody, we, we have technically cut several positions by having a hiring freeze and not hiring people to replace those who have retired. Um, because of that, we're still going to be behind for years to eventually come back to where we were before. And that will take even longer without, um, if we take more out of the fund balance now to try to not have the tax increase. So for all of those reasons, I'm in favor of this budget. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Um, thank, I thank you again to the administration for, for the work you've done in preparing this budget and to all of our uh, you know, associations and groups for the concessions you made. Um, while, you know, I, I would like to see us never having to raise taxes any year, uh, I do agree with Dr. Bacher, Dr. Levinson, and, and Ms. Bowman, uh, you know, the decision we make doesn't just impact next year, it impacts the, the long term for, for the school district. And I would hate to see us make a decision just for one year and, 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 and have it spiral into harder decisions and more impactful decisions in the future. Um, you know, I do think the administration did a great job minimizing any, you know, the tax increase and, you know, I think it's important for building uh, the, the budgetary uh, soundness for the future years that we do, um, we do proceed with an increase this year. So I, I am in support of, of the budget as proposed and presented today. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Bird. Uh -huh. Mr. Bird, you're uh, Mr. Bird, you're you're on mute. You're on mute. 
I think from where we started at, at the beginning of the budget process, we are a long ways away from where we started. I think the administration done a great job in getting us from a $6 million deficit to do a balanced budget. Uh, I'm concerned if we don't do anything this year, we will have a, uh, a detrimental effect in the future of our physical uh, plan and uh, our budgets. So basically on that, uh, where we've come from and where we've been and where we are today, tonight with this budget, I would like to support this budget as it stands tonight. Tonight. Thank you, um, Ms. Winch. Hello. Um, I just want to thank the administration, Ms. Campbell, and, and for all of your valiant, valiant efforts to make this budget process actually happen and make sense. And your relationships that you have with your with the staff, um, we we know that it, it's with your relationships that these things have gone so well, and your leadership that aren't just about all of our bargaining groups have really come through and made um, great sacrifices. And I'm, I'm I just want to thank you so much for it. I agree with all my colleagues colleagues on the board that are saying that we need to look at the future of our um, of our district and I will be I, I will be voting in favor of this budget today uh, thank you um, I see a number of hands still up I don't know if they're still up from before um, I'll just call on you again and if you have more to say then uh, oh they're going down uh, so I don't see any other, uh, I'm assuming Ms. Winch, you're, you're... I'm done. I don't know why it's not up there. Okay. Um, seeing no further comments, I guess we'll move forward to the district update. Ms. Mrs. Campbell. All right, a few announcements um, for the community in particular. Just a reminder that our grab and go meal program, the last day for that will be Wednesday, June 10th. Um, the meals that families can pick up on June 10th will also include lunch for the last day of school, which is June 11th. Um, and as the meal program comes to a close, I just wanted to um, recognize the efforts of the leadership of our cafeteria, including Mr. Velastic, Mr. Velasix, Mrs. Havrilla, as well as our entire cafeteria staff, who likely I know that the board and the community recognizes that literally days within the closure, um, our cafeteria staff was able to um, begin providing meals for students. So we're very, um, we're very, very appreciative of their efforts. The other um, recognition that I have goes out to all of our teachers, administrators, um, leadership from STA, our local de police department, as well as our EHS Hornet. They were all instrumental in helping the East Penn Education Foundation deliver our class of 2020 senior signs earlier last week. Um, hopefully you saw that campaign on social media. Um, as a result of the collaborative efforts of EPEA, our Teachers Association, Student Government Association at the high school, as well as our foundation, we were able to provide all of our seniors um, recognition with a senior sign. And for those of us who were fortunate to be able to put signs in seniors' yards and surprise them and wake them up at 11 o'clock when they were still sleeping, um, it really was a great opportunity just to get out and reconnect with our kids. I think it was Adam Smith who talked about the value of relationships. And so um, our kids were very happy to see us come greeting them. Um, also speaking of celebrating, um, it's, it's 1134 tonight and we're still going strong with our meeting, but I don't know if anyone has had an opportunity to um, check out the Allentown skyline, but downtown Allentown led by PPL Corporation and City Center Investment um, 
actually lit up the Allentown skyline tonight in Emmaus Green as part of their celebration of all of the local high schools. And so it just so happens that tonight, June 8th, um, the center city is lit up green. So hopefully you might have a, a friend or family who was able to get out and take a picture for you. Um, another community announcement, our high school graduation has been postponed until July 26th. We will be prepared um, with either an in-person or virtual ceremony. And obviously we will make those final decisions regarding um, if an in-person ceremony is possible. Um, certainly we will do that by, by very early July so that our families can continue planning. And finally, the East Penn administrative team recently released a message of solidarity in response to the tragic death of George Floyd and other racially motivated incidents that have occurred throughout our country. And I, as emphasized in our message, we share concern over how these events are impacting our students. Respect, kindness, and compassion have always been part of our values. But what recent events have reaffirmed to us is the importance of listening and speaking out. Racism, discrimination, and hate have no place in the East Penn School District, and we are committed to continually examining the issues of inequity and making sure that all students have access to the resources, the programs, and the experiences that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Are there any questions or comments from the board on the district update? No. Naomi, is that, uh, Ms. Winch, is that a hand up? Yes, yes, it's a hand up. It's a very sleepy hand up, but it's a sleep, it's a hand up. Um, I just have one question. I, we all feel extremely terrible for our seniors who are not being able to tr traditionally enjoy their senior year rituals. And I wonder if waiting to make the, make an announcement whether or not to hold it virtually in, or in person makes any sense because even if we move to a green phase in Lehigh County, there's still restriction on events for over 250 people. Um, I would like to ask you to consider making that decision sooner than later uh, for these pa families so they can properly plan maybe even for vacation. Um, I just it just seems uh, kind of silly to me. I understand that guidelines could change, but uh, I'm not feeling pretty any confident or it doesn't seem to me that even in a green phase that we would be able to hold something that large inside. Thank you. But the end, but thank you for everything, honestly. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Winch. Are there any other comments from the board? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Um, then uh, before we get into personnel, uh, I have a comment that there is a correction to item seven on the personnel items that the uh, uh, National Junior um, NJHS uh, advisor is actually a Schedule A academic position and not a Schedule B um, Club D position as indicated in the uh, agenda that went out and so that will be updated and we'll be voting on that as a uh, Schedule A academic position. So with that said, uh, I'll entertain a uh, motion to take all the items in the personnel section, items A through D together. So moved, Elisa Bowman. Second, Jeff Jankowski. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Yes. Ms. Smith? Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass, and I'd like to thank again the uh, bargaining units that agreed to a pay freeze uh, uh, this year. Um, uh, it really helped, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it really helped uh, our job and the administrator's job, administration's job with putting a budget together. So I just want to 
one more time express my appreciation personally. Um, moving on to business operations, if there's no objections, I'd like to take a, a motion for items A through E uh, together. Okay. Dr. Barber, can I jump in real quick? Did we skip uh, four budget? Did I skip? I, we did skip that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I scrolled off my screen. I apologize. Um, uh, item four, uh, the budget, uh, we have to take all the items A through D together because they're all inter interrelated. Uh, may I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved. Elisa Bowman. All second. second. Moved and second. Um, is there any discussion on any of the items in the budget section? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? No. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? No. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Seven ayes, two nays. Motions pass. Dr. Bacher, this is uh, Mr. Saul. If I could just take one minute. We've had with us this evening um, to answer questions if there were any um, on the, uh, the, 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 the refinancing piece, um, Scott Shearer and Ken Phillips. Um, I'm going to assume in the interest of time that we have passed that and nobody raised any questions, but I wanted to acknowledge them spending most of their, well, all of their evening with us and thank them for being present for any questions we may have had. Yes, th thank you. Appreciate they, it. They earned their fees tonight, that's for <laughs> sure. Thank you and good luck. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to business operations, I'll entertain a motion for items A through E together. So moved, Adam Smith. Second. Second, Second. Paul Champagne. Uh, is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass. Um, moving on to policy. Um, uh, if, I don't know if there are updates in here, in this section. Um, if we can get through it uh, quickly, I'll, I'll continue with it. Um, uh, there are no changes. Okay. Uh, then I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the, uh, the policies, the third reading and approval of the policies. Paul Yad Munson, so moved or seconded. Who, who did the first motion? Paul Champagne. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass, or motion passes. Um, other educational entities, uh, Ms. Bowman, CLIU update. <laughs> yes, um, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, at the last meeting, um, you know, I, apparently there had been negotiations with the Education Association um, before the pandemic happened, and 
what they ended up doing was just extending the current contract by one year um, rather than making any changes. And then uh, they got a revenue anticipation note, which is kind of common for the IU in case the state money didn't come in in time for 15 million. But um, it looks like they're probably not gonna need that uh, given the state situation. And uh, I guess everybody knows they formed a task force to help all the schools start in the fall <laughs> and um, hired a few classroom teachers and that was it. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Are there any questions? Then moving on to LCTI, uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, I'll make this very brief. There was a virtual joint operating committee meeting held on May 27th. Uh, the D LCTI is uh, evaluating reopening scenarios uh, in lockstep with their nine member districts. Uh, they will be reporting out to the JOC on their reopening uh, schedule and reopening op options at the June 24th meeting. Uh, there was video ceremonies recognizing seniors by their instructors that was held the last week of May. There was a video ceremony featuring students uh, and announcement of senior awards that was held in early June. And then communities and schools will be providing their annual report and assessment in, at the June meeting. That is my report. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Uh, are there any questions or comments from Mr. Champagne or comments from the other members of the, our representatives? Uh, then moving on to other items, um, Mr. Smith, would you like to uh, make your motion. Ken, I think you skip, yep. skipped item nine. Man, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hold uh, I, I apologize, can, I, Ms. I can, Jankowski, can uh, we have a legislative report? I can take a hint. <laughs> You're just um, as important as the budget. Yeah, that's what I get for joining late. <laughs> um, so, Really brief, I, I just want to applaud Governor Wolf and the General Assembly for, for making education a priority um, in, in passing the budget. Um, you know, I mean, it, they really went, you know, they, they, their focus was on maintaining the funding, and, and I think that, that's, that, that was very appreciated. In addition to that, the, uh, the budget also transfers $300 million in CARES Act funds to the um, property tax relief fund to make up for the decrease in gaming revenue to help fund the homestead and farmstead um, applications. So I think that that was also um, a benefit of the, of the budget. Uh, one final note uh, might be of interest to some, the uh, Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association has been working with the Department of Education concerning guidelines for restarting interscholastic sports. And the PDE is expected to release guidelines as early as this week, so we may get some some clarity on when when teams can start gathering again and, and practicing. So, and that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Are there any questions, comments from the board? Now, moving on to other items, uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to make your motion? Are you on mute still? Okay, wait for everybody. Okay, um, I'd like to make a motion uh, that the Board of School Directors for the East Penn School District release the following statement. We, the Board of School Directors for the East Penn School District, as elected representatives of our community, feel it is important to publicly comment on the events of the past few weeks and their impact on our local community. These events have shaken us just as they have shaken many of you. The recent tragic killings of Mr. George Floyd, Ms. Brianna Taylor, and Mr. Ahmaud Arbery, just three of the many acts of violence committed against people of color, force us to confront the ways in which racism, hatred, and bigotry remain ever present in our country today. We stand with Americans across the nation in expressing our deepest condolences to the families of Mr. Floyd Ms. Taylor and Mr. Arbery. We stand in solidarity with persons everywhere who have been the victims of racial inequities and injustice. We stand in support of our staff and students of color 
and their families, and we want you to know that we value your voices. We embrace this opportunity to amplify those voices. We are taking this opportunity to actively seek input from our community to better understand how to achieve our shared vision of a safe and inclusive teaching and learning environment for all of our staff and students. Help us to see how to make East Penn a better place to live and learn. We are listening. Sincerely, the East Penn Board of School Directors. Is there a second for the motion? Elisa Bauman, second. Uh, any discussion? Yeah. I... Mr. Smith. Uh, yes. Um, so this, this piece of paper represents quite literally the least that we could do um, as an organization. Um, there have been plenty of statements that have um, been released by um, all sorts of organizations and businesses and um, some good, some not so good. Um, but the worst thing that we could possibly do is to um, have them just sit uh, as words. So um, I'm just gonna um, leave some comments um, and then listen to whatever discussion folks would like to have. Um, so um, I, I put my, my thoughts together in what I call the parable of the playground. And I hope that you'll uh, entertain that while I uh, read it. I know it's late, but I, I do appreciate uh, the time that um, everyone is giving to us here. Let's say there was a piece of playground equipment that a small group of kids love to play on. Most days, some days, pass without a problem. But as time went on, more and more of the group of friends would end up bonking their heads. The recess monitors came running over to check on them. They didn't offer an ice pack to every single one of the kids that day because they weren't the ones that had bonked their heads. That would be silly as the other students weren't in any pain. Their concern was only for the kids that were hurting. This is similar to what we are facing today. In caring about the needs of all of our community, we must turn our concerns to those who are hurting. And for those of us charged with leading the community, we have to not only think about what has happened, but also what must come next. And so in this case, the principal chose to explore what happened to try to prevent it again from happening in the future. Was the equipment faulty? Did it need to be repaired? Did it need to be removed or maybe just placed further away from a high traffic area? Perhaps the problem wasn't the equipment itself, but maybe the mulch surrounding it was just too shallow. The principal wasn't there to see it happen herself, so she set out to collect information. And that's where we are today. We are asking for your input. Something must change and we must figure out how to help and why. So I would like to take this opportunity on a personal note to um, uh, ask the public to um, share with us your experiences both in our schools and in our community. And uh, if there are any thoughts that you have um, about the things that we have in place currently or what we could do in the future, please let us know because this is not the end of the conversation. Uh, these are not just words and um, I, I feel pretty confident that my colleagues will um, share a similar sentiment that um, it has to continue past this today. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Munson. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of, of the resolution and appreciate the efforts that went into um, formulating it and, um, and the sentiments it expresses. I'm so, I don't have words in part because it's so late, but um, I, I do think that there, you know, there's always a danger uh, of proclamations like this, that they remain not just proclamations. And so I'm very supportive of, um, the community, the administration, others on this board thinking about concrete actions that can be taken um, and not just uh, not just words um, after you know every one of these killings um, and just uh, like three ideas that 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 come to mind i mean there's there 's big ones like 
thinking about how to incorporate anti-racist curriculum, um, things like uh, recommitting to social studies as a, as a core subject on par with other uh, subjects um, that can give a more robust uh, idea of how inequality works and um, history and so forth. But then also, you know, really, really concrete, specific things. Um, for example, um, a report from uh, the district uh, that looks at um, whether or not there are racial disparities in in-school suspension and other disciplinary uh, actions. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I have asked for since we uh, approved the SRO program, which was mentioned by a member of the public uh, many hours ago, um, is that uh, is a report on on how that program is improving safety. Um, I've heard nothing but positive things about the specific um, person, uh, Officer Kloss, who, who holds that position now. But one of the things that was promised um, but never delivered as a best practice uh, for that was uh, concrete, measurable um, impacts of SRO programs. Um, so those are just examples, um, and I, I hope that we can follow very soon on this with, with uh, concrete actions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munson. Um, Ms. Lynch? Hello. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith, for taking the time to reflect on the situation in the United States and around the world and bringing us together as a board to find ways to do better by our students, our family, staff and community who are black. On the third paragraph, we say we stand with the Americans in solidarity. In solidarity, I wonder if we could add and the global community to accurately reflect the enormity of this movement. And when we say by standing in solidarity, we are recognizing that here that black people absolutely have different experiences than their white counterparts that white supremacy, racial inequality, inequity, violence, murder, bigotry, and hate exists as a tragic part of our American culture and within all of our institutions. I believe as a district, we are doing our best, but East Penn is not immune. Black lives matter. And if we don't do something to change it, or if we stay silent, we are part of the problem. And I really appreciate the last part asking for input on how to make East Penn a more just district. With our board consisting of only one director who is black, it is impossible for us to see the same the experience, the same interactions as our East Penn students, family and staff and community who are black and members of uh, uh, people of color. One area for change as a district, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear that train right behind me like Mr. Munson, I live in Emmaus, one area for change as a district in making a commitment to hiring more when we are hiring, or even create more teachers and administrators of color. It is a proven fact that children of all races do better academically, are better problem sol solvers, and are more critical thinkers if we have diverse teachers. It is a disservice to students that here in America, the vast majority of educators are white and female. And as a cut country and as a district, we can and we should do better for our students, family and staff to have more diverse representation. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Witch. Uh, Mr. Bird. Move myself. I, I guess over the last couple of weeks and talking to uh, Adam about this uh, resolution. I support this resolution because I believe, uh, I go back to the 1960s, where we did have a protest, we had the racial inequality. We thought we solved it by legislation. We had legislation. I think it got watered down and we're still back 20 years now, we're back where we were. And I think what happened then, it was came from the top down. I think by this resolution, we're looking at our local community going from the bottom up. I think that's what we need to drive the change. I think this resolution shows our leadership as our district and our board that we're willing to drive this change and this difference. And also our community, 
in our world. And I support this resolution, and I look forward to have dialogue with the community, the district, and my fellow board members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Bird. Uh, Dr. Levinson. Thank you, Dr. Bacher. Um, my, my colleagues who've spoken already have, have really touched on most everything that I have thought about. So uh, I wholeheartedly endorse the, the feelings and sentiments that, that were there. And I just like to say that I'm in strong support of this motion and certainly mo most supportive of the idea that, that we'd like to uh, have input and action as a result of this. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, I too am, am very much in support of this statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, for, for preparing this. Um, you know, I think it's important that we as board members support a, a, a school district and community where, where all students and employees are feel safe and valued. Um, you know, I, as I've said many times, I have three young children and, I, you know, I think, you know, listening to them and hearing them ask and questioning why this are happening, why these, you know, why different people are being treated differently. You know, I, I think that that's where the education starts. I think, you know, bring, bring, having an environment where, where, you know, our, our children don't, you know, they view each other for the people that they are, you know, not for their race, their ethnicity, I think is critical. And, and I'm very much, you know, in support of hearing our, from our community and, and helping make sure that East Penn School District is is a is is a place where, as I said, uh, everyone feels safe and valued. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, I too support this motion. Adam, thank you so much for taking the the energy and the time to to put this together. Uh, racism has been a stain on our country, uh, and it is time for us to listen and act. It is you know we need. To, to make the changes, it has gone on far too long. So again, thank you for your, your, your diligent efforts. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Smith for proposing this resolution and, and uh, word crafting it. Um, at the start of, well, I guess almost a week ago, I was thinking, you know, what can we do? There's a frustration with what's happening. And uh, I would agree with uh, Mr. Smith that this is the least we can do. Um, but then I thought about it more. I read some opinion articles on, on whatnot. And um, really education is a great equalizer and a great leveler uh, in our country. And unfortunately, there's also a, a, a large achievement gap between minorities and um, uh, white students. And I know several board directors in the past and for quite a while um, have expressed concern over that and what can we do about that. And I know we've attempted to address that on socio on socioeconomic basis with some of our initiatives. Um, but if there are other ways to address that, I think that's an important thing to get input um, for example, the diversity um, approach. I know with women in STEM, one of the big uh, issues is whether or not women see um, role models in, in STEM for themselves and perhaps something uh, like that is operative here also. So I appreciate all the comments and I appreciate uh, Mr. Smith um, putting this together. Thank you. Ms. Bowman. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this short. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Smith for bringing this up. Um, I am happy to vote for it and just want to state that um, this is the beginning, not the end. Um, I am definitely here to listen and learn. And um, it sounds like I'm heartened to hear that we have unanimous support for this um, and that at midnight all board members made <laughs> a comment about that. It shows um, that we're all very like-minded here and we stand strong together in support of this. Um, and 
I don't know. I, I'm for all of the different solutions that people have said, but I think the number one thing is um, for us moving forward is to um, seek input, listen, and um, hear what people of color in our school community have to say and then move forward from there. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, I don't see any further um, comments. So Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll? Dr. Munson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Winch? Yes. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Yes. Champagne? Yes. Mr. Jankowski? Yes. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to announcements. Um, there was no executive session uh, before this meeting. Our next regular uh, board meeting will be on Monday, June 22nd at 7.30 p.m. I'll now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Ziad Munson moved. <laughs> I had Ziad Munson moving, a second. Levinson. No. Levinson seconding. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? <laughs> Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Yes. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.